So hello and welcome to episode 109, is it Mark? It is 109, yes. You know, that's, uh, that's a lot of fingers and toes we've counted on to get this far. <laughs> we only have to do about another 10 to retire and then it'll be at least another year or two before someone catches us up, so <laughs> we can have a break and then... Yeah. Oh, I don't know, you said, I think it was... Uh... That fellow who does the podcast, he did an absolute shit ton in the first lockdown. He was like doing one every couple of days. Was he? He's, I, uh, I don't know what number he's on, but I know he's put quite a few out. I haven't, I haven't noticed any, to be honest. The, um, I only really look at the charts. Uh, no, I don't even look at the charts. Mm. I just get uh, an email from the chart companies every week. So I have a quick glance um, at the different places. And it, it seems the, um, is it the Baitcast podcast? Yeah, Baitworks, um, yeah. Uh, Baitworks, sorry, yeah. Mm. They're always like just behind us in the charts, regularly maintaining like sort of top That's eight um, position. Um, obviously, the Nash ones usually in there. Uh, they're normally just behind us as well, and then Corda just mm. in front of us. Um, I, I look at the top sort of sort of fifty, um, which comes through, but I've never really seen any other fishing co- podcasts in in that kind of yes. top twenty. Is there, so, is Keith think, Arthur's in there? He's doing one called Strange Boat. No, no, it's not. Well, I'd have thought he'd have got some traction being... Uh, I'd, I'll have another check. Now, now, you know what it's like? Um, it's like uh, it's the way our brains work. So whenever you... Uh, your brain takes in so much data, it can't, like, recall it all the time. So now you've said mm. that name, Strange Boat, I probably see it everywhere because my brain's now, like, tuned in to look at it. It's like, yeah. um, you know, when uh, someone you know is getting a new car and you say, oh, what type? And they say, oh, I'm getting a... <laughs> Um, what shall I say? Should we go old school? Vauxhall Calibra, right? Oh, wow. So, it's and you're like, oh, um, what do they look like? I, I can't remember seeing one of them. And because now your brain's like alert to it, you'll see them everywhere, and you'll be like, why am I seeing that type of car everywhere now? When I'm um, saying that, you wouldn't see a Vauxhall Calibra now. I've not seen one in years on the roads, but but you, everyone must know. You you know what I mean by that, and, and it's just the way our our yeah. brain works. Do you know, I've yeah. had exactly the same thing recently with caddy vans. Because mm-hmm. I'm I'm needing a new motor. My car is uh, it's going. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, it's costing me uh, nothing. I'm not paying anything on it. So you keep it going for as long as you can. Oh, I do anyway. Mm. But it's ready for knackers yard. I'm. Uh, it's got a battery drain on it. I'm having to disconnect the battery every night. Otherwise, it won't start in the morning. Which um, yeah, nowadays it's not uh, not the one. I've got to put the key in the door to actually unlock it. Yeah, but it's pretty old. It's pretty like most of my uh, gear. It's uh, it's battered but functional. I I uh, I think it was my first first ever car it was a Mark II Ford, Ford Escort, yeah. and the key for that car opened every Ford in our town, <laughs> <laughs> and and nice. every other Ford key opened my car. It was crazy. Nice and secure. Yeah, for my first car was uh, it was a little white Maestro and. There was no stopping me fishing as long as I got that. That was the best piece of... Well, I know it's often been said, but the best piece of fishing kit you can ever get is a driving licence and a car. Definitely, yeah. And uh, we uh, we had a maestro at some point during uh, our family life. And, yeah, hatchbacks uh, mm. back in the day. Any sort of hatchback. Oh, what, what was the car then? Um, lad, Glenn, Clu- uh, Glenn Cooper. Shout out to Glenn and, uh, and his dad, if he's listening. Rod Cooper, he was, he was uh, a very influential... Uh, on my angling when I was sort of, you know, around that learning to drive age, actually. I mean, the only reason I got a driving licence was to go fishing. You know, I was that keen uh, when I was young. And uh, my birthday was in August, and I passed by December. Um, but on, my, on my birthday, I was at college, and um, first driving lesson, you know, was like, like at lunchtime, they picked me up from college. And um, there's no better motivation, you know, to learn to drive or do something like that, um, than uh, to be free to go fishing whenever yeah. you you've got time, you know it's a it's an absolute game changer. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, mean, I was um, I mean, it's like my first time driving. Uh, well, my first time on a motorway was a fishing trip to the A1 pits, mm. and uh, I say that was scary. It's probably more scary for me passenger doing about eighty five in a maestro. It's rattling. You're wondering what bit's going to fall off next. But uh, it's good fun. It's a little adventure back then. Yeah, I, I had. Um, I remember I'd, I'd not really done, <clears throat> excuse me, many long trips. Um, I'd uh, passed my test. I must have been eighteen, 
So I uh, left home to join this band in Luton, mm. which is sort of where a lot of my family was from. And um, a drummer out of me, uh, my uncle's band, like a professional band. He, uh, <laughs> shout out to Kev, uh, Kev the drummer. Uh, get this, get this forgotten. Um, he was a brilliant drummer, session drummer, taught by one of the um, uh, top drum teachers in London. And uh, they, he was friends with one of the guys. All my uncle's band were friends with uh, a couple of guys from the brand new Heavies. Have you heard of them? So I've so, heard of them. Yeah, yeah, sort of funk band. Um, and the drummer from there um, said uh, some guy we know or is on our label or whatever is um, putting together a band do you want to go for the audition and he was like what's their name and uh, he said Jamiroquai he was like who who is that they were literally putting the band together anyway he never went he uh, he didn't didn't um, didn't follow it up and he was the perfect style for that as well it was that sort of syncopated super super technical funk drumming and uh, anyway, yeah, he, he, he <laughs> didn't go within a year. I remember him telling us in rehearsals um, for our band, and uh, within a within a year, they were just massive. They were just everywhere. He was devoured. He ended up wow. be, being a session drummer for the brand new heavies uh, for quite a while, <laughs> and then um, the Bay City Rollers <laughs> after that. <laughs> so not quite, um, not quite Jamiroquai. but yeah, I, I moved down to me. Nan's in Luton to uh, to join this band, and uh, I think uh, it must have been like around Easter time or around the. In fact, no, it wasn't. It was winter. Yeah, it must have been like November, December, because uh, I'd literally moved into my Nan's for like two days. I was bored. Um, I didn't have like a social network or anything around there at uh, at that point, other than like the band rehearsals. We were rehearsing like most days and then um, I was just like bored out of my head and um I remember it was midnight like on a whatever day it was Wednesday Thursday or something I was just like I'm going fishing where can I go fishing and uh, a couple of years previous we've been going down to Bude in Cornwall and there was a lake down there called uh, uh, Bude's in Devon actually near the Cornwall border and um it, there was a lake called Lower Tamar Lake, which I think we spoke about in the early podcast. But um, we'd been there a few times in in Easter, in in like those holidays there, because uh, as anyone who lives down there or travel or was fishing in the eighties, they'll know that uh, they had no close season. So like the whole of England, when when the close season happened in England, like every carper in the land went to Devon and Cornwall and fished the lakes around there. There was College Reservoir. Um, Oh, what were the others called? There was Lower Tamar, Upper Tamar. There's a few lakes, like, and they're all like council owned, um, big big reservoirs and stuff. And most of them, they just had tickets on like some sort of machine or like honesty box type thing, um, like uh, on the lakes themselves. So you literally just turned up. <laughs> I think it was like midnight. I just decided I was going to go into Devon. I was like that bored. My nan was she was worried, you know, like as as old people do, and I hadn't been driving. Uh, that long you know probably six months or something it was just like bosh I'm off threw everything in the motor and gone and uh, it was a fairly disastrous trip now, in fact no it wasn't disastrous it, it did the job I went for like I think I lasted about a week eight days or something and uh, didn't catch anything it was, uh, I remember it was definitely winter because at that first night when I got there I slept in the car I slept in the car two or three nights because I was moving around the lakes because there was there was five or six sort of decent lakes within like an hour or two yeah uh, once I was down there I was just uh, dr- driving uh, you know a couple of nights here freezing cold no signs of fish drive to a different lake quite often I'd decide late at night you know um, and then just drive to another lake sleep in the car and I remember it was freezing and Every fisherman will know, I think, on any sort of long journey, they'll know how uncomfortable it is to sleep in a car. That I, I, I don't know if I've ever, until I got a, like a camper or a proper bed, I don't know if I've ever had a good night's sleep in a car. Or that, you know, when you're driving long in the middle of the night to go fishing, whatever, and you just stop in the services thinking, I just need an hour's sleep now. Yeah. Like, I can't drive any further, and you like like, pull over. And um, you always wake up like worse than you've felt before, don't you? You're aching and God knows what. But you know, have you got any uh, yeah. <laughs> late night driving stories for fishing? Yeah, I've got one scary one. I've been going. This is 
you know, I was fishing, uh, I can't remember if it was like, you know, St. Ives or the Wolf Pack, but it's one of the lakes down there. Anyway, I'm, uh, you know, I finished my uh, night shift, you know, I had a pizza, I had a coffee, what have you, got the gear in the car and uh, early hours, uh, I'm off. You know, aiming to get down to whichever lake it was at first light. And, you know, you're driving down the A1, you get past Peterborough, it's A1M, goes into four lanes, and then you get off onto the A14. Yeah. Well, I remember thinking, oh, I'm tired. You know, I've put the music on full. You know, I've got the windows down, so it's trying to wake me up a bit. And then uh, I remember thinking, oh, I'm not far now. A14 turn off will be uh, close, and it's not far at all to go. And then I remember thinking, oh, I'm actually on the A14. How did that happen? <laughs> Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, I need to stop driving like this. I need more coffee. I need to stop if I'm feeling tired." So, yeah, it's um, I, you know, in that you you've done it. Obviously, you've done it, but uh, most people relate to this. That um, it's a public safety message for driving tired when when fishing. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, you know that like um, tr that trance state you get in sometimes. Like you're driving fine, you're aware of everything, but like. Did you ever get are somewhere you? and you're just like, I think you are. Did you ever get there and just think, I don't remember any of that journey? Like, I don't remember, you know, getting from that motorway to that motorway or pulling off there or whatever. You just, mm. you're where you are and you just sort of um, think like, I just actually don't recall any of that journey. I don't don't remember driving through this bit or driving through that bit. Did you ever have that? Yeah, I've definitely had that. I mean, I remember uh, there's another public service announcement from the Carpcast on safe driving. <laughs> I still remember one session. Again, I'm going down to Elster One. You're already there in the reed swim. Mm. You were uh, phone me up because you know I'm on my way. It's again silly time in the morning, and you're telling me you're thinking about moving to the point next door because the fish are crashing all over the place, all over the spot out there. Mm. And this is back before hands free. I'm holding my phone to my ear, and I was on the phone to you right from where you drive past uh, Grenville on yeah. the left. Right till pulling up at the gate. Yeah. Which, uh, what was that, a good, what, 40 mile? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't do it, people. Unless you get in the, the lowdown of where the fish are. <laughs> then do it hands-free. Obviously, and, we've all got hands-free these days, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, it's different now, and uh, the phone was a lot smaller. I yeah. think I was probably a Nokia 3 to 310 back then. Yeah, oh. when the when the old elbows uh, hurt from holding the phone. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. doing like you know, I regularly travel between three and four and a half hours to to go fishing each way, like every trip. Um, obviously, living in the back house of of Blackpool, um, and there's just you know, you know, you've got that three and a half four hours drive. So either get some good podcasts on these days, but in the early days, you just yeah. spent the entire journey on the phone to your mates talking about fishing. So it yeah. was uh, Roger and I both ring each other. Roger, Roger hates driving at night, which obviously, you know, if you want to get to, um, to the lake at first light, which is the best time to arrive at a lake to see the fish, you know, oh, so that, that gives you gives you a much better. And any anglers listening to this that don't, I mean, I know we have a lot of experienced anglers that listen to this, and they will, um, you know, they're not teaching uh, your granny how to suck eggs, but you know, for the for the for the newer anglers, I used to feel like I'd wasted a day if I didn't get there at first light because you're setting up blind otherwise your actual chance of seeing fish after sort of nine in the morning oh it's greatly reduced massively reduced you know everyone knows and sometimes different times of year it's it's different times the fish show so you know a few of the experienced anglers uh really experienced anglers we've had on here and i'm i'm sure uh it's not a question we asked ed but i'm 100 percent sure ed, ed does this as standard but during your three or four day session you will make sure that you watch the water for all 24 hours of a of a day period you know so um because you don't know what time the fish are showing so sometimes they're showing between like two and four in the morning if you're never up between two and four in the morning you're just not going to see them sometimes it's now before light sometimes it's an hour after light but until you know that window but when when you're narrowing down information which um that's what i think you know being a good carp angler is it it's um you've got a lot of incomplete information i know i know the answers that i need but you don't know what the answers are you know the right questions to ask so one of the, one of the things 
is really crucial is when's when's bite time which changes throughout the year you know sometimes it sometimes it's early hours sometimes it's tea time sometimes it's midday you know winter time i always say sort of december through to february is midday till two in the afternoon is usually the hot spot but sometimes it's a bit later than that um and it changes um, which i'm presuming is to do with light levels and um temperatures is is a massive uh i think if you collected water temperature you know throughout your fishing career when you catch you would spot a lot of patterns i think you know temperature on the rise temperature on the drop coming out of winter i was used to say when it hits 10 degrees which is that sort of time now we're, we're coming to that time now really um although there's a lot more fish in a lot more lakes these days so lakes do seem to produce earlier and more consistently through the winter now uh, certainly the better stock lakes i mean i know we've spoke with julian about this a lot um but does that guy ever blank he's literally fished <laughs> three days a week three four days a week through winter and uh it's every day and i just know he's going to catch you know he i've seen him uh through a half frozen lake he's like found a little bit and you're just waiting for the pitch picture later on aren't you you know there's going to be a fish yeah, um, he's uh, well. He is one of the best if fishers, um, you know, well stocked waters, and he knows them well. You know, he's uh, well, like you say, he's one of the best. He's got everything nailed down. He's he knows his rig works, his bait works. All he has to do is put it in the right place at the right time, and it's uh, it's going to happen. And he's got what you know, best part of forty years carp fishing experience, and puts it to good use, and uh, and shares it with everyone as well. So. Big up yeah, to we say we say it enough, don't we? Uh, but what an asset yeah. to carp fishing. Right, I'm just going to. Uh, there's a cat trapped in this room, and he's banging on the door now. So to avoid <laughs> unnecessary noise, I think I can hear some cars or something in the background going by. You got a noisy road today or something? Ooh, it's got quiet now. It sounded like you had a washing machine on or something. I could hear like oh a car. In yeah, the street. it's um, you know, recording. What is it? Twenty past eleven in the morning. The road just down there. Well, I don't know, 100 yards from it, it is busier than where it usually would be in an evening, but hopefully it's not too bad, it's not uh, it's not affecting people's listening experience. Cool, we've got uh, Tom jumping in about half past 11, he's just messaging me now. Ooh, in um, eight minutes, lovely. But I quite enjoyed that, um, the uh, WhatsApp yeah. chat. Yeah, a little insight into uh, you know, the uh, journalism business and uh, the drone talk. Yeah, yeah. Heapy Bob messaged me yesterday saying uh, he's got a couple of drones, two of them DJI drones that we were talking about. Yeah, yeah oh, wow. I think I think it used to got your little one under the table. <laughs> I think he might have broke when I tried throwing it onto the bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much useless, to be honest. Is it? Yeah, it'll. It's got no range on it whatsoever. It's a little plastic toy as much as anything else. And uh, when we took it out, half a gust of wind sent it flying across the field, and we had to go chasing it. Uh, exactly the same thing happened to me. I bought one of them fifty quid ones from from years ago when they first came out, and uh, I went in my back garden. I sent it up, but like kind of over the street. <laughs> it went over the trees. Bit of wind came, and it vanished. Um, <laughs> we and I've got a big graveyard cemetery behind uh, behind like the bottom end of the street mm. and uh yeah we walked around there for ages eventually found it on the gravestone <laughs> <laughs> it worked yeah. like well, i've got know. uh i've got another drone story mm. while we wait for tom this is a few years back um i was out on a video shoot with uh you know ed was there mm. um, do you know where uh, Stuart hay uh, i know that name yeah I'm not sure why yeah, it was with the uh, pure fishing at the time i believe he's with uh, angling direct now or was well, last time i uh I know he's doing their uh, Avanta products. Yeah. But anyway, we're on um, you know, on this uh, lake and doing all the uh, JRC uh, video shot things. Yeah. And this one shot, it was one of these, um, you know, it's like utility fronts that go on the front of Bibbies. It was one of those. And the shot was myself and Stuart sat either side of it and just talking about fishing, having a brew as carp anglers do. And the drone was to fly over the top of us. Yeah. And this was quite a large, expensive drone that they'd hired out for the day, along with uh, the pilot, who, if I'm honest, was a bit of a knob. <laughs> it was just, just arrogant, but whatever. He's flying this drone in, and 
I'm sure Mean Street were thinking the same thing as it's coming in, thinking that's coming in a bit quick. <laughs> it did. It came in very quick and hit the tree behind us. <laughs> and, yeah, it was uh, it was a costly mistake for him. He uh, did quite a bit of damage to it. Oh, really? He wasn't, uh, he wasn't happy. <laughs> so did you get fishing this week? No. No, oh, yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, no, I've had, um, had a couple of days off work and just um, things to do. You know, just running around and, uh, you know, I didn't manage to get out. You know, I had to, um, I had to drive my wife for a hospital appointment, which obviously I couldn't go in, so... It wasn't far from the little club lake I've been fishing. I went down and spent about half an hour just having to walk around and looking. So it's keeping in touch with the lake. That's another thing we mentioned about, uh, you know, getting there at first light. Even just, uh, you know, walking around in the middle of the afternoon when you've got the opportunity, it just keeps you in touch. And in this case, it uh, I could see where someone had popped down and was pre-baiting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A little bit of fish that spot, obviously, but... Uh, <laughs> A little bit of bait in the edge, was uh, there, or... Uh, to be honest, he had a walk around. He pulled through baiting quite a few swims. So, yeah, well, I'd, right. I'd have I done thought... exactly the same. I just wanted to done it when I knew someone was watching. Yeah, the golden rule of fishing when pre baiting: never let anybody see you. So after dark, before first light, um, and then, which yeah. is what I was just thinking. Then, when you said uh, you knew somebody was baiting, then whichever swim you put the bait in. Go and throw 20 boilers in the margins of a different swim. <laughs> like, um, yeah. and, let, and if anyone does watch you or seen your car come in or out or whatever, or the, they were in the trees and you didn't spot them, whatever, you know, they tell somebody else, oh, Jamie was down there baiting up, pre baiting. Um, and then, you know, somebody sees a few boilers in a, in an area, they just naturally presume that's where you're baiting. So if anybody does want to try and shaft you, then. Um, the best way of doing it is have a pocket full of peat gravel if someone's watching you just throw the gravel in let them fish over that yeah yeah um, if you know there's a spot with the stinkiest blackest silt you can that's where you put it <laughs> yeah uh, definitely yeah but a little move for pre bait in the lake yeah but what, what we were saying before about um making sure you sort of watch the water every 24 hours i think if you're doing less than if you're doing one night or two nights, it, it gets much harder. It kind of is what it is. You're, there's a bit less chance to move, although we, we saw how successful Paul Harris used a 36-hour session. You know, that yeah. there's a, I, don't, I haven't witnessed many people making the most of, of sort of one night and two full days. In fact, it's not. was it two full days he used to do? Yeah, he used to get basically two like, days, didn't yeah, he, one night? A day, one night, and then, you know, half the following day. But oh, mine, there's um, even when I used to go down there and fish two and three nights, and uh, occasionally even longer when I actually could. There's a few occasions where I've caught fish. I can think of the um, the first time I caught the uh, leathery one. You know, it's a little dark looking twenty. You know, I've done it. I've uh, packed the gear up in the car. Then I found the fish. Uh, oh, like you know, I think it's one about three or four feeding right in the edge. I've got a rod back out and then nubbled one just because I was having a, a walk round at the end when the gear's in the car I've got time I'm having one more last look so yeah and uh, Paul uh, he told the story on that old school carp fishing group recently um, where uh, when he caught the mother you know Paul made some great stories we mentioned it before didn't we on that group Mm. but um, the day he caught the mother um, he woke up in the morning the wind had changed Uh, bear in mind you know he got there the day before um, probably had a few beers and a barbecue with us, <laughs> most likely at night. Yeah. In fact, in fact, we we did, didn't we, that night? Um, you weren't there when he uh, had the mother. I wasn't. There was because I remember I was in the headland, Paul's in the snags, and uh, we had a couple of beers and a chat in the evening, as you do, because we were talking about the possibility of a full year's blank. I think we were both up to around twenty nights at that point, and it was uh, quite a conversation. Considering the next morning he woke up. A lot earlier than I did, which I just blame uh, alcohol and hay fever medication. And he uh, he moved, spent the last few hours of his session with singles, cast a show in fish, and uh, bingo, forty one pound forty an ounce of uh, mother later. Yeah, one of the the finest carp in the country. So um, yeah, yeah, he certainly deserved that fish. Um, he earned it. Oh, uh, without a doubt. To 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 have like one night a week, and and to you know, Elstow was not an easy lake to to um, negotiate as far as logisticals you know there was nobody took a barrier to our stokers there was absolutely no point there was no swim you could ever push any gear to 
I thought um, the Hawthorns just knackered your uh, <laughs> tyres up. I started with a barra and uh, you know the punctures were just relentless. Did you get a barra nicked on there? Um, I did, yes. I had something else On the Terminator well. swim. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I was fishing the Terminator and it's a steep bank and you can't kind of see behind you. And um, even that Terminator swim, I mean, how, how high, how many steps did you kind of have to, you know, like made ah, steps you didn't fish that swim in the rain. You <laughs> would just bounce your way down. No, no. Anyway, uh, we have Mr. Tom Ayres in the waiting room. Uh, how are we this week, Tom? Yeah, I'm good. Really good. Uh, went fishing yesterday. It was absolutely crap uh, on the <laughs> on the Thames. I thought I'd try and get in a, a sort of river session before the end of the season, and um, yeah, caught some tiny fish at the end. But um, no, all good. I have to say, before we start, I really enjoyed last week's podcast. The, well, last week as it stands, I don't know. I get confused. But the yeah. Simon Pitt one, I yeah. thought was yeah. was a brilliant one. Just uh, no offense to Simon, he might not be a headline act. You know, anglers might not be. You know, he's not Terry Hearn or you know, or someone like that. But he, I just found it a really interesting one last week. And uh, maybe it's because I'm in the trade, and it was there's bits of stuff stuff in the trade. But great stories about Yateley as well from uh, from you and uh, talking about Terry Hearn and Tesco's. I enjoyed that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was a good yeah. So I've had a, I've had a good week. Yeah. Fantastic! Uh, nice, nice to uh, nice to hear that. Yeah, I, I really enjoy talking with Simon. Uh, with, as, as I sort of prefaced it, and one of the reasons why we did it is the first time we spoke. Um, it ended up being a near near five hour conversation. It was just like it, it just flowed easy. The conversation with him is he, uh, an interesting guy, and I guess there's some shackles on what he can talk about on the Corder podcast. That uh, they're very very professional and. You know they're they're quite stringent on the content that they want to release. I know a lot of stuff gets cut, um, including the interview I did with them, uh, <laughs> which they pulled. But because it was there was it was all industry talk. There was absolutely nothing about fishing. Uh, apparently, uh, Damien Clow when he listened to it, I think Dovey wanted to put it out, and uh, Damien was like, it's "Fish call me, it's fish there, it's fish there." He didn't ask him anything about the fishing sort of thing, and it's um, it was like just get him in the studio for for the long one. So yeah, I've got a date booked in. Uh, to go up there to uh i've never been to the corner buildings have you been there tom yeah i went uh probably february last year just before everything shut down really impressive i went to their old or maybe old old building mm. which was a bit of a dilapidated um building on a on a industrial estate and then this place is incredible um That's sort of unbranded you ju- i only noticed it was the right building because the, the font for en- exit and entrance was the same corner font uh no way. And it's uh, yeah, went for a sort of mini trade show there, and was uh, was given a tour of the, um, the that podcast studio. And I know, as you discussed, I mean, it's just yeah, they've they've kitted it out properly. They've you know, there's no half measures with those lot, and uh, yeah, really impressive. And, and because they've, it's not just called it's Guru as well, you know, their match brand as well. So it's mm. a big old enterprise there. So uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he told me it was very impressive. He was he was sort of quite keen. So when you come down, I'll, I'll give you the tour uh, of everything. And um, I've had tours, obviously, of some of the other factories. You know, I've been down to Fox and uh, and Nash, obviously, the the big the big one. Plus the off, uh, excuse me, the offices uh, where Kevin does all the sort of media stuff. But um, yeah, the, it, I was thinking, Corda must be it must be an impressive building. Uh, the the way they were talking about it. And there's um, what is it next door? Is it like the sort of European head office for one of the coffee companies? Isn't it? Um, I think Starbucks or one of them. Can't remember. Uh, anyway, yeah, what's been going on in the, in the fishing world? Um, well, I've just, I've literally just before coming to you, I've just been on the phone to Chris Blunt, who's the uh, manager, the fishery officer at Linear Fisheries. Um, I thought I'd, I'd touch, you know, catch up with them and see what's going on because um, uh, they are only open to local anglers at the moment, and they're, they're strictly enforcing that. So I appreciate it might not be of relevance to, to every listener, but the, it is the most popular day ticket carp site in the country, and, and it hopefully they, they're hoping it might well reopen on March 29th fully. Um, to be honest, they're, you know, Easter and April is often their busiest month, so they could do with it. Uh, Chris was saying they've basically been closed for six of the last 12 months. Um, there was a lad on there, Anthony Bennett, on B2 yesterday, had two 40s and an upper double uh, in a day session. So there are fish coming out. Um, yesterday was uh, I'm in Oxford itself, and uh, I was on the river and probably should have been carp fishing, to be honest. It was good carp fishing conditions yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris, but I, I asked Chris if there's any sort of trends, because it's quite unusual that a water suddenly goes days only, and obviously the fish have had a rest and anything that you know we could take into our own carp fishing. And to be honest, Chris said there aren't really any trends. Then you know the fish aren't getting caught at any particular time of the day. Um, 
At the moment, it's only B1, uh, Brazenos 1, Brazenos 2, and Hardwick Smiths that are open. The last of those is definitely the quietest out of those three. So most anglers are heading to B1 and B2. Um, I'm just looking at my notes. He said that B2 fished quite quiet last week. Then B1 did quite a few 30s over the weekend. And now it's back to B2 being the, the busy one. So it doesn't seem there's any rhyme or reason. It's it's zigs and pe solid PVA bags that are, that are dominating there. Um, and it being linear and it being brazen nose, there's big fish coming out. You know, if, if you catch something there, it's it's probably a 20. And there's lots of people. Um, well, there's this lad catching uh, two forties in a day yesterday. So it was good to catch up with Chris and just see what what's going on. I think they're raring to go, to um, hopefully you know open the floodgates for for anglers nationwide. You know, end of this month into April. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. Uh, I will be going there as soon as we can. Although um, I, I need some sort of filming type trips, uh, work trips in. So that, that's a bit of a funny one. I mean, I'm. If I go, it'll be for work. Um, can I? Can I do that? Can I drive to Oxford? What, uh, uh, do, do you know if he's letting? Um, not Chris in particular, but um, this could be an example. If, you know, if he's if he's letting the companies and you know you know like um, anglers that are working in the trade, you know, if people have been doing filming and stuff down there that are coming from further afield. <coughs> I th I think so, and, and I don't want to speak on behalf of Linear, but I think I saw Dean Macy was filming down there, and uh, possibly Matt Godfrey went and helped film uh, a roach. I think Matt's, uh, I think Dean's targeting the the roach on the Brazenose waters. So uh, I might I might have got the wrong end of the stick, but I think I saw a, a social media post um, from from Matt Godfrey, one of the guru lads, who went down there and um, was filming one of Dean's sort of diary pieces he does. So. Again, I might be wrong, but I think, you know, if you're doing legitimate filming and work like that, then it it might be the best time to go there because it's relatively quiet. As I said to Chris, as Chris said to me, there, there aren't many anglers on the bank at the moment because it is restricted in terms of those pleasure anglers, as it were, um, from where they can travel from at the moment. And the the weather's been absolutely crazy this week. I don't know what it's been like down south, but certainly here in Blackpool, we've had uh, yesterday was the sort of peak day for the wind. So I was booked to go out fishing um actually uh, do some filming i'm gonna do like the kind of local lakes around here around blackpool which i've just always ignored but obviously while we're we're having to stay local um thought uh, go to the park try and catch one out of there which i haven't done for sort of 10 years and there's uh, a few other sort of farm ponds and stuff around so i plan to go out and then it's like 30 mil of rain every day for the last three days and 50 mile an hour winds and when you get a strong westerly wind in blackpool it's really strong obviously it's coming straight off the sea we're on the coast so you know i have to change the roof on the house every few years right everybody does in blackpool it's trashed all, all the all the um you know the brickwork it's like that old sort of red brick saint anne's brick it's called um and you have to get it repointed you know every few years it's just the salt water trashes it yeah and if you're looking to buy a car in the in the country um and uh you spot any sort of western seaside town you know as a as a destination don't <laughs> because uh they're salt damaged underneath uh, usually it probably goes for most coastal towns but certainly the ones on the west um yeah a little tip i, I never really thought about till i moved here but basically blackpool people don't <laughs> don't buy cars off blackpool people you know um in fact i think if you were gonna actually be smart about that you know you you, you could identify some good towns for weather in the country you know inland uh not too much and yeah there's going to be saying that the the car companies cars don't really rust anymore do they they're, they're, they're pretty much got on top of that haven't they with coatings or whatever they do but if you're as old as me uh you know rust was a an everyday problem with a car you know it didn't have to be many years old and th those old chrome bumpers and stuff you know i remember polishing them with tea cut like every few days but yeah don't buy a car from blackpool <laughs> Um, yeah, what else we got? Um, we mentioned probably a couple of podcasts ago now, maybe two or three, about uh, drugs in the water, didn't we? Pharmaceuticals that are sort of yes. washed out of of humans and of livestock um, and are going into um, our waterways. And uh, I wrote a story for it for Angling Times. Um, and a professor of water science got in contact with me this week, uh, who's an angler as well, had read the story in the Angling Times and does just that, just looks into... Um, the sort of chemical makeup of our waterways in the UK. Uh, and I had a good chat with him on the phone this week. It was an informal chat, so I won't name him at the moment. He might 
be happy to be named but um we, we were not doing anything formally with him at the moment in terms of a story but it was good to to speak to someone who's an angler and someone who's doing this sort of research in the uk um and he's promised to send me um a few journal articles to have a look at but basically he says it, they're everywhere whether it's farmers who are feeding their livestock um antibiotics and then it goes through them into the manure and then the manure washes away into the into the rivers and he says that you it's it's in every even in the rural places even in the more urban waterways and things like that there are chemicals that are that are difficult to to get out almost impossible to get out and no one's really looking at the cumulative effects the um the effects that an antidepressant mixed with ibuprofen mixed with um some other drug might have as a as a whole um and we talked about the the cocaine thing the illicit drugs thing that that often gets headlines and um he was he joked that you know it's difficult for scientists to sort of test this kind of thing because to do so they'd need pure they'd need a pure sort of test uh you know he said to me 99% pure cocaine in their lab to sort of do the tests against and that's obviously very mm. tricky to get to get funding for to have that in your your lab but um it was good to hear from an angler who was interested in it and and it might lead into something you know it's it's difficult to quantify the problem because if you look in a stream and the water's running clear you think there is no problem but but there are these trace elements of, of chemicals so just that was that was interesting just to take that on a bit further and um it might be something that, that rumbles on into the future a little bit yeah it's, obviously it's a, a developing story um we this is something that you know i'd, I'd never really considered before and, and as you said it's a cumulative effect i mean everything that's happening in the world has happened in the last 60 years really uh you know we had the sort of industrial revolution you know 100 well over 100 years ago now probably 150 years ago when that kind of first started but then we started you know pumping uh coal you know residue uh you know burning burning a lot of coal uh, to power machines and and stuff like that and, and uh, then obviously the whole country got electric uh what year that was but late 1800s i would have thought um, early 1900s when the electric came and this like the earth's been here billions of years you know humans in the modern form a few hundred thousand years but you know two-legged sort of man doing stuff hunting and bits uh, what um a few million uh, yeah a few million years it's like but in the last hundred years the change has been like no other um because of people you know populations up to whatever it is that they think it's going to peak at nine nine billion and then uh come down uh as as the poorer countries get more educated they have less children and stuff so that's the uh the depopulation that bill gates was talking about not poisoning us all with with vaccines but um it's like it's all un unquantifiable because it's it's so new and the rate of progressions happening so quickly you know we didn't if you were the richest guy in the world rockefeller in the 1800s he didn't have penicillin like when he got toothache all his money in the world did not help him you know um he didn't have central heating he'll have had a damp castle or or wherever he lived you know got really ill every year like this stuff has happened in a hundred years out of us doing human stuff for nearly millions of years so it's like we need to catch up with stuff that's going on so we need you know like uh this is starting to get recognized now i mean this is a new problem that's never existed so at first people will be um you know is it really something to worry about but we just don't know because we're changing the world's changing so fast um you know out of millions of years 100 years is like an absolute blip you know what i mean it's, it's like a a one second period of a day like seems kind of insignificant but it's changing stuff way quicker than anything can ever do and we should be worried about this stuff i think um because because we don't know and about uh, rivers because i remember as uh, as a kid i'd be in my parents car you drive over the river don going out of town it stunk there'd be these big rafts of foam and it was just dirty lifeless almost sludge all from the steelworks upstream at sheffield mm. and well, i think now there's some of the best fishing around in the River Don. It has been, you know, it's cleaned up, you know, it is, uh, it's brilliant. So yeah, I think everything's, uh, you know, relative, you know, because it's, uh, I'm sure there's problems still back from that pollution. You go to, I'm sure if you go down and get a handful of, uh, you know, deep silt, there's still going to be traces of what have you in there. 
but uh, compared to the problem in the past, in not too distant memory, I don't think it's. Uh, it's yeah, and it's got same, thing, worse. same thing happened with the Manchester Ship Canal. Obviously, we were using the canals and waterways for you know big boats and industries. Uh, you know when the sort of travel networks were all about the water. You know for moving uh, industry stuff around again, coming out of that industrial revolution. Um, Obviously, we know, you know, you can see that the water's all, uh, you know, oiled up, you know, tankers probably dropping, you know, waste crap in there and, and, and all sorts. Uh, obviously, we kind of dealt with that problem now, haven't we? Mo most waterways uh, we have paid attention to. I'm guessing the, the EA uh, have had a lot to do with that over the years, restrictions brought in and stuff. Um, but the, the drugs one, I wonder how much of the problem, especially in the rivers and stuff, is coming from the farmers because... Um, you know whatever humans are doing farmers are doing on kind of an industrial scale so um we know the the pressure of sort of modern society supermarket farming the pressure farmers are under to uh, you know make stuff quicker and faster and we, we know steroids and all sorts are injected into into animals to speed up their process um generally why i don't haven't eaten supermarket meat for quite a few years um it, it's when you start to look into what's going on so I, I don't know you know are animals given antibiotics kind of constantly um just as part of the, you know prevention or whatever i don't really know that um you know and is there a lot of stuff going into the waterways sort of daily from the industrial commercial scale stuff it is quite scary when <laughs> once you start thinking into it it's um yeah uh worrying when do you when do you think we might actually get some answers from this is going to be a long running thing i think so this uh, this professor's been doing it for 20 years and clearly um science is ongoing and he's clearly looking into it and i think um it's a case of you know it's not the most well-funded thing in the world you know finding a cure for cancer is is much more important so it falls down the the sort of scale of things that that get funding and things like that so um yeah i think uh, with the with the farming and the agriculture side of things i guess there's less processing between the the effluent and the river i mean there is the cows don't sit on toilets and flush it into a waterway system so there is the the the, the sort of transfer is a lot easier a lot simpler and yeah i, I don't quite know what um what goes into into livestock but um certainly antibiotics and and as you say i'm sure other bits and pieces to it to, to meet those uh, you know ever increasing demands of the supermarkets and that probably does just go straight into the to the waterway so yeah it, it's one of, it's a bit of a difficult story to really grasp and i appreciate that listeners might think well you know why should i care and stuff like that and i think that's a perfectly valid natural reaction um but it might just have a build-up effect and it might have an accumulative effect and and we can we're very good at we've been very good at eradicating the the pollution that we we can see as mark says you know we, we can get all the iron ore and whatever else that's been thrown into industrialized rivers out because it looks like an eyesore and once you remove it you can see the results but these are invisible and you you can't you can't t tell the clarity you can't tell the purity of water just by its its clarity so um yeah it's an interesting one perhaps more of a one for a bit of a deep thing and something to ruminate on but um it, i'm sure it will it will rumble on I remember a film, um, a famous case. Remember the Teflon uh, scandal? Um, you know, Teflon coating, it was advertised all over the place sort of when I was a kid. Um, you know, frying pans, reasonably new technology. Well, um, some farmer in America noticed all these cows dying. Um, uh, they were actually getting cancer um, when he cut them open. Anyway, like hundreds of them died, you know, on, on his fields. And. Uh, big long court battle but turns out it was uh the residue from or the waste from making like these teflon pans um was going into the rivers they were dumping it from some chemical factories in, into the rivers or was seeping or whatever and they tried to cover it up but and uh, a lot of these towns around these waterways people were dying cancer rates shot up and um it was a uh, it's, it's quite a famous story if you google it like teflon scandal sort of thing they, they ended up having to pay out a lot of money but it was like it was less than a day's profit you know that they paid out in total it was it was absolutely crazy yeah and um i don't really know what happened with like the teflon um can you buy teflon pans anymore i'm not really sure but I, I know the process got changed in the end but basically frying your bacon in the morning was was giving you cancer you know and uh 
and fairly quickly it, it was pretty pretty nasty this stuff but again um the the point i'm making is the farmer had real problems he knew his cows were dying and um, he'd cut a few open and and knew and saved the hearts and and frozen them and stuff and and you could see you know the the cancer in them and he had them tested and he had such a battle to actually get anybody to admit that it was coming from the from the rivers which is because you could in fact there were telltale signs like the the rocks in the river you know as, as the water's going past um they became bleached almost um they, it was like it was like cleaning the rocks off and he it, it, it documented everything because he knew something was wrong but it he had this battle to actually prove that there was a problem now now you know we we know cancer rates have gone up massively in england don't they and it's definitely from the things that we do um you know it wasn't as common so you know stuff that we eat or maybe chemicals in the water or, or whatever it is so um it is good that we've got people looking into this stuff i think it's um uh, and it's you know i mean i can't believe there's still climate change deniers you know pe people that <laughs> that don't think we've changed the world like given all the things that i've just said the population the the industrial boom the the things we consume you know in numbers we don't we don't just eat natural stuff that we grow ourselves in the garden anymore and, and animals that we that we grow and kill our, and kill ourselves and it, like we don't eat like that anymore it's everyone else makes stuff for us and there's side side products and, and effects of doing that and um like i like and i think it's mainly mainly traveling it that's done the um uh, you know just stuff with that we're burning and, and putting into the air that's, that's done the climate change but always gets me the client changed his eyes ago no the world's heated up before and you know it just goes through cycles i'm like how do you know it heated up before well the scientists told us well the scientists are telling you that it's knackered now <laughs> like and we're causing it so which one's right <laughs> like you can't have it both ways it's it's um you know this because of science and and the science is telling you that uh yeah anyway let's not go down that road it's just as bad as probably talking about trump <laughs> trump or something isn't it uh have we got an and finally i haven't done this yet did i tell you the other week roger roger bacon um uh when i mentioned that we want like uh you know something to make a happy ending for our for our news pieces <laughs> so we don't have to think about climate change or fish changing sexes or whatever he's like um he, he had this idea of getting like a a little jingle like uh it's probably probably a little bit stereo typing horrible but um like uh some sort of uh massa uh, you want happy ending <laughs> roger says i need to find a jingle for that. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah anyway uh your happy ending tom uh, what, what is it this week <laughs> What an intro! How do, how do I follow that? Um, well, I'll give at least we've I'll, just made a clip for the uh, for the trailer. I will, I will provide this happy ending, but it'll be of a different sort. Um, yeah, let's get off the doom and the gloom. Um, I just thought I'd bring to attention. Um, there's a, a lovely lad, a, a under, an underwater filmmaker and a general wildlife cameraman called Jack Perks. Um, He's recently been on um, Country File and Spring Watch and stuff like that. Um, so listeners might have, might have seen his stuff, might not have necessarily heard the name. Uh, he's an angler, uh, and he's at the moment he's crowdfunding for a, a film project he wants to make called Britain's Hidden Fishes. Um, he, he's quite interesting because he straddles the world of angling but also wildlife filmmaking, um, and he's well aware that fish don't really get much of a look in when it comes to you know Attenborough and stuff like that he knows that they're difficult to to film in the wild which is probably a barrier for a lot of projects um so he's decided to to get off his backside and do something about it and make something um which shows a wider audience what we know as anglers that, that fish are, are amazing creatures um Jeremy Wade of River Monsters fame has agreed to narrate it um we, we've covered this in Angling Times and, and he dropped me an email this week and so it just uh, sprung into my head to, to mention it to, to a wider audience. He's, he's currently fundraising for it and there's various sort of things. If you donate, you can get certain uh, perks of, uh, of, uh, of donating. But he's, um, I spoke to him a few weeks ago about, you know, what have you seen underwater? What sort of weird um, things have you seen fish do? And I appreciate this is a carp-centric podcast, but we all generally have grown up on a diet of other fish and, and other fishing. Um, and he was telling me some fascinating stuff that that perch have learned to hunt in tandem with eels. So when eels are, are scurrying under rocks and trying to get bullheads and things like that, 
the perch aren't stupid. They know that that will send a flurry of prey fish up into the water column as they try to escape the eels. So the perch just come along above the eels and pick off those fish that are that are being forced up. Which I think I don't think anyone Jack doesn't think anyone's ever you know scientifically documented that other than him who's seen it underwater when he's gone diving. Um, he told me about grayling that we think of them as the lady of the stream, but. Uh, to quote him, he says they should be the bruiser of the brook because they fight like hell when the males want to sort of get a mate and uh, and and at spawning time they they really sort of butting together like rutting stags. When we think of grayling as quite graceful creatures, um, and, and other th- he's seen lots of other other amazing things. There's some mullet that uh, come. He calls them sort of mullet spa days. There's a uh, um, there's a tributary of the uh, of the Sussex Ooze, uh, where these mullet come every spring um, from from salt water into sort of the freshwater sort of meeting point, and they sit with their head upstream um, from into the into the freshwater and just use it like a spa to sort of cleanse themselves of all the things that have um, have sort of attached to them uh, out at sea. And you could he says you can see 300, 400 mullet all all in one ball, and they won't touch a bait. They're not there to feed. They're there to to give themselves a bit of a spa day before they go off to spawn. So <laughs> he's he's seen some amazing stuff, and I and I hope he's got quite an ambitious target. I think it's sixty thousand pounds, and I think he's sixty percent there at the moment. Um, and when I looked yesterday, there were four weeks left of fundraising. So if he doesn't get the the, the money together, then it won't happen, and, and people won't have paid. It, it only happens if if the target's reached. But it might be something that that. He, he he is like lots of us was inspired by a passion for angling and he wants to create um something like that but just shows that sort of hidden world of course and and sea fish in this country um so that might be an interesting one to to look out for it's on indiegogo is the fundraising platform he's yeah. looking for so, we'll, pop, um, we'll pop the link in the youtube underneath um that sounds like a really interesting project i wonder if um the chap that we've had on uh uh, on the Carpcast before has uh, become a friend. I think I mentioned him last week or the week before. Actually, when we were talking about the recycling eco packages and stuff. But Jody Borton, he's uh, he works for Jeremy Wade a lot, and he's a BBC producer. Obviously, they do independent stuff as well. Um, but he has mentioned a couple of times been working on new projects. I wonder, I wonder if this is is one of them. Um, I'll give him a, a text shortly actually and find out if, uh, what he knows. I'm sure he'll know about this. Uh, whether he's got anything to do with it or not, I don't know. But yeah, it, uh, Indiegogo.com uh, forward slash projects forward slash Britain dash s dash hidden fishes. Uh, but we'll put the link underneath in. Uh, uh in this and if it's anything that's of interest to you but what you say 60 percent there or something i think so i had a look yesterday and i think he was 60 percent towards his target as i say you need a bit of money to to make a film uh about something i think it's gonna be an hour-long film um so he's yeah he's ambitious fundraising projects but there's there's some people backing it i know you you mentioned people involved with wildlife filmmaking and stuff and i know he's got bbc cameramen and award-winning production staff on board so it will be a polished production if it if it comes to fruition yeah that makes even more sense that probably jody's uh, got something to do with it. but I'm, I'm interested we, we we shall find out if we can get a little inside angle as well uh, as well uh, as that i'm glad there's people out there doing this sort of stuff because as i said we've all seen the you know the blue planet type stuff there but they tend to tag fish like dolphins and whales and stuff that that really appeal to um kind of like a, a wider audience but we know they've got that technology we we know you know people are generally interested in stuff that goes on about underwater so it's really interesting um i'm sure like the general public would actually want to see what lives in the bottom of our rivers waterways reservoirs you know and and the habits of our local stuff i, I don't see it being any less interesting than some whales you're never going to see in a in a different atlantic ocean somewhere you know it's i love that just just to see what everything does and it's going to help you with the habits you know i'm sure he's going to come across carp or is he only doing rivers or did you I don't think carp are on the list at the moment. There'll be. A, I think he's going to take two years to film it. He wants to have um, two bites at each season, if if it were. So you know, he can spawn. He can film spawning, say once, and if he doesn't quite get it, he can come back the next year. So it's a, it's a project for the long haul. I don't think carp are on his uh, his radar at the moment, but they might be. You know, if, if people if people know of certain groups of carp that exhibit really weird behaviours, and we all know that carp can be. You know, can have personalities to a degree. Then, then I'm sure he'd be uh, be all ears. 
Yeah, definitely, and it's probably going to come across them. You know, there's even the River Ribble near near me. It's you know, it's full of carp, and lots of rivers are the Trent and and many around the country. So you know, he's going to see them, and obviously they're all interacting together, aren't they? So, yeah, very very interesting to see. Like you said, Grayling, you have you have this this picture of them in in your head from seeing the pictures, and they you know they do look quite graceful and elegant and stuff. But like you say you don't see what they're doing on the bottom, bullying the other fish around or. <laughs> or whatever they do so yeah I, I love stuff like this and it just shows you i mean uh, we, we spoke a lot in the last episode about media and editing and you know obviously the way the the carp fishing industry is catching up um with you know all, all these films and filmmakers out there but just like you said there to make a one hour film um he's trying to raise 60k uh, was it 60k you, you said or i, I just think, made that i up? think so, something i might have made it up i think it's around <laughs> that mark yeah um and it's going to take two years to make a one-hour film because, as you said, he wants seasons, you know, over a couple of years because uh, one year might just be a, a unique freak thing, give himself more chance. But a two-year project is planning now just to get an hour's film out. It shows how much work go into some of these fishing videos uh, that are made, especially some of the good ones that feature underwater footage as well. It's it's no small feat, is it, for impatient people? It's, it's probably not the right career, but it's certainly time-consuming. But, yeah, if you were going to make... I mean, could we plan the ultimate carp fishing movie? What what would you want to see if, if you wanted, you know, wanted to do everything? Money was no object. You had two years, three years to go and make this. I mean, some TV projects they're a lot longer than that, aren't they? They, um, you know, multiple years, five years. Uh, some of them crazy to even think about it because <laughs> I'm, I'm learning as well it's like wow <laughs> you could you could do something that seven up project is it seven on the itv have been running for like 60 years that every seven years they go back and interview that same cohort of people when they were seven 14 21 i think it's called seven up something like that it's been running it's on every seven years you could do that with a, a vs fishery stocky couldn't you see how it go, gets on in raysbury <laughs> or something like that who knows yeah is that still going that project i've not seen it for years but I, i've i've seen that um in the past um yeah it must be still going i would have thought i think so i think they're getting on it i think the the some of the participants you know are no longer with us i think they're in their 60s 70s maybe now but yeah well you could do that follow a carp's <laughs> lifespan yeah <laughs> interesting okay well then um, thanks for that happy ending <laughs> and Thomas we'll see you next week <laughs> cheers Tom cheers, cheers Tom man. see you later uh, anyway so thank you to Tom um, we don't really need to go on anymore Mark do we because we had a lovely chat with uh, one of your friends yeah at Betteridge one of the uh, I don't know if I want to use the word um, yeah, underrated but uh, he has caught a sick amount of big big fish and you know what we didn't even cover all of the lakes he's fished he's had some brilliant results on quite a few others that were even mentioned and how many did we talk about on there you know three captures of 50 pound carp god knows how many 40s a couple of near 50s yeah and, and they're not the easy ones either uh you know they no. were from you know we, we met ed on some of the lakes that we fished over the years um and ed is you know he's a true hunter he's one of those low stock anglers you know we've got a bit of space competing competing against the fish instead of other anglers uh, we had a great chat with him and he, his phone did cut off at the end um uh which do not be disappointed it's not a short interview in in it <laughs> in any way whatsoever you know it was almost two hours we were we were talking with him um he's a lovely fella he, he works in the industry he's an extremely good angler and you know how good an angler he must be uh when roger bacon called me uh to after mark you put up like the promo picture yeah uh, and we should talk about that picture with the dog actually um is that not one, one of the, the best out there yeah, one of the best returning shots there is. So there's a picture of him with a yeah. 50 pounder and it looks really big. It could be one of them 60 or 70 sort of continental shots, you know, in the water. Huge fish, which is at the perfect angle as these dogs swimming in to, to have a <laughs> have a little nosy. And uh, yeah, what a fantastic picture that is. Yeah, it doesn't want the fish going all the attention. So uh, I don't know what Ed's dog's called, but uh, it looks like a little, um, you know, Patterdale Terrier type that you see lots of uh, carp anglers around. And it's just. It's not just uh, you know the framing of it, but um, I'm sure Ed'll correct me if I'm wrong. But is it um, Rupert who was the uh, Rupert Wyman? Dead? Yeah, I believe that might be his work taking the shot. Yeah, it's um, 
It's a fantastic shot. Ed's a fantastic angler. And uh, as I said, Roger Bacon rang me and he was like, I'm really looking forward to Ed's interview. You know, he's w what a good, he, you know, one of the best target angler he is. He, he generally mm. catches the fish he goes for. And we did talk about within the podcast. So um, let's get him in. Mm -hmm. Feels like I'm in to welcome to the Carpcast, uh, Mr. Ed Betteridge. How are we doing, pal? Yeah, pretty good. How about yourselves? Yeah, it's all right. A few slapheads between us, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I just... Um, <laughs> Will's biggest comb over. <laughs> I wish I had something left to comb over. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll lend you some at the next show, whenever that may be. I'll uh, bring a bit... Yeah, that, that, that to... could be any time, really, couldn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a funny one. So you work in the in the industry, Ed. Last time I saw you at a Northern Angling Show, you were with JRC. You moved on from there to where are you now? I'm with ProLogic. Um, well, a company called Spencer Sports. So ProLogic is one of the the primary brands and probably the main brand that, that you know the, the listeners of this all, all, all know because it's a car brand. But there's there's quite a few brand brands within the catalogue. Another big one is. Um, Savage Gear, and then we've got Sierra, DAM, Ron Thompson, IMAX. So there's um, there's a lot of brands there to be uh, concentrating on. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, we know Svensson Sports, obviously. We've had them at the show. We have Savage at the at the show as well, I think, in the past. Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You look confused there. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Um, I know from uh, from working in the shop, Savage is, uh, you know, along with the clothing, it's a real good uh, seller for you. So, uh, oh, yeah. Know. There's some really good kit, you know, some of the laws that, that Mads is producing and, the, you know, the guys at head office are producing. It's, it's just so realistic now and, and the action on them is, is, is absolutely awesome. And this is this is coming from a sort of non-law angle. You know, I'll, I'll have a little bit every now and then, you know, a little bit of a go every now and then, but I'm not by no means an expert. But just, just to see how some of these laws work in a law tank and uh, just, just to see how some of them react. I mean, they almost look like real fish. It's um, it's, it's, it's really good what the, uh, what the engineers have done there. Yeah, I've Jamie, seen, I've seen were, it demoed. Um, yeah. Have you seen any of those YouTube videos? Is it? Um, I'm sure it's Savage Gear, where they're towing them behind that camera. You see all the action, and all of a sudden this big mouth of uh, teeth just comes up and grabs it. Mm. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen a few of them. They're awesome, aren't they? Yeah, it <laughs> makes you jump. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I want to be a little roach with, uh, with that as my last sight. <laughs> no, definitely not. But I've got to ask, Ed, as well as fishing, are you a cricketer? I can see a cricket ball. Yeah, I can see a cricket ball in the front. <laughs> I thought it's a cricket life. ball or a stripy apple. No, this is my this is my stress toy. So when people are winding up at work, I just uh, bowl a few. Throw it at them. <laughs> <laughs> were you? Uh, were you? Did, did you play then? Uh, not as much as I wanted to. No, um, I, I used to play a bit as, in my early teens, um, but um, fishing just took over really. And you, you know, you've got two time-consuming sports like cricket and and fishing. And uh, yeah, fishing was the Fishing was the one that won through, really. I was, I was the same. I played for the county when I was like under thirteens, under fifteens, I think. And as soon as I left school, never played again. You know, that was, that was the end of it. <laughs> um, uh, although I, you know, I was fishing uh, at the time, but the lake was really near my house. But um, yeah, I was quite into cricket for a few years. Bit of an all-rounder sort of um, bowler, batsman. Um, Do you know what? You were you, you bowler then? I, I always fancied myself as a pace bowler. Yeah, uh, being six foot four and. I, I just I just fancy whacking one down at ninety miles an hour and uh, and watching the batsman dance around a little bit. But in in, in reality, I was probably never that good. But I, I, I'd have liked to have been. <laughs> I was an Ian Botham batting at number six, uh, sort of medium pace bowler. Um, I could swing it a bit though. If we if we got we had never got new balls at school. They're always really old. But if we got a new ball, a new ball give me a few overs with that polish up one side and i could make it really twist in the in the air it depends on conditions it was when it was cloudy it was better obviously being a fisherman you notice this stuff don't you yeah. like the lower pressure and stuff and the atmospherics definitely helped it but i remember i bowled i think i bowled i didn't bowl everybody i either all but one or all but two like i i 
bowled the ball out because it was the ball we had a new ball it was rare and it was swinging perfectly nobody could deal with it i'd literally after a few overs i just got it right where it looked like it was going outside and it just came in at the last minute and bump just, just kept bowling them out and then um uh uh me and uh me and the batsman i went in we went in one and two that time and um me and the other batsman like literally won, won the match um I remember getting standing up in the assembly my proudest moment <laughs> <laughs> up in the assembly could literally single-handedly won a cricket match um nice do you know yeah. um, i had a very short cricket career for the school i think they were yeah. short they were short for one uh, match against another school and um i didn't get to uh, an assembly uh, ovation i actually got detention because i got sent off for swearing <laughs> How did you get sent off at cricket? <laughs> I, I, uh, I called the um, teacher, umpire, whatever he was, a uh, blind bar steward, but a little bit too loud. You know, when you should have said something under your breath, but didn't. Yeah. It was an early shower for me. <laughs> Good effort. Yeah. Perfect. You sound like you're in the room now. You sounded like you were kind of in the toilet and we were in the living room. Before. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. as long as that's clearer. <laughs> yeah. Um right, so we've covered cricket. Should we actually talk about fishing? <laughs> Let's talk about fishing. Yeah. I mean I mean that is what we do on this podcast. We like we like to go where the conversation goes. If you drop a, yeah. a red cricket ball right in the front corner of the screen, <laughs> we're gonna talk about it. <laughs> I didn't, didn't realise it's actually on the screen. I, I thought it was a prop, it looked good, it looked good, yeah. It's um yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice background you've got up there, Ed. It's uh what's that picture on uh, your left? Pulp this fiction. Is, this is this is Mrs. Mia Wallace. Yeah, my my favourite movie crush of all time. That was. She was sexy. Incredible. Cigarettes and guns and a bit of a yeah, a bit of a character, wasn't she? <laughs> oh yeah. 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 This is this is my office and fishing room. So. Your little man my, cave. Yeah, a bit of a man cave, bit of everything. So they've got my fishing books there. I've uh, got a bit of gear lying around. Got another load of rods up there. Bit of a fireplace mm-hmm. and. Yeah, this is this is where I spend a lot of my. A lot of my time these days. What part of the world do you live in now? Midland. Derbyshire. Yeah. Okay. Which is which is absolutely rubbish for fishing. So this 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 lockdown is is quite painful really because I'm I'm miles away from any sort of decent fish. Well, well um, all them all them lakes at the end of the A50 I always go past. I knew um was it Swaddling Coat or something? Was, was that? Yeah, I'm not called? far from there. Yeah. Not that that there. used to have a good in years ago, didn't it? Um. There's. The ones at the end of the A50. Oh yeah, yeah. You're probably talking about the part of Derby Waters. Hmm. Um, you can see them off the M1 as you're going northbound. Yeah. Um, this, this, yeah. I think there's a few forties in there now. Uh, there's a big old long waiting list. I think it's done a a forty-four common if 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 the rumours are right, and, and two or three of the forties. So, I suppose from that point of view, it's it's not too bad. Um, there's one next door called Red House that I used to bail with oh, years and years ago. Um, and that's done a forty pound. I think my, my brother was the first one to catch it at forty pound uh, an ounce. Uh, that was about five years ago now. So I think that one's still in there. Um, Not good enough for it anymore for the for the <laughs> you know a big fish angler, isn't it? It's uh, we we you know when we joined Elsto, you, you were fishing pit two, sort of similar time. Or was it just think? Did you overlap with Mark for one season? Or were you on there before me? I think yeah, was, you were shortly after us, weren't you, Ed? Yeah, I can remember you had the. I think you had the pit one ticket when I had the pit two ticket, and mm-hmm. I, I can I can always remember uh, being on the decoy swim and looking across. There's like a clay bund across the back bay, and it was these biggest yeah. ever footprints in this clay bund. And I'm thinking, who the hell made them? <laughs> and then Mark was walking around the corner barefooted. And I'm like, oh, that'll be you then. <laughs> you think there was a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot wandering around the Yellowstone? It, it did make me wonder, yeah. And I was thinking, why is he not wearing wellies? Why is he why is he barefoot? <laughs> um so yeah that. obviously we we joined that what's that that's not far off 20 years ago is it now uh, i first joined in 2001 the season uh where you caught the two big ones was 2002 my last season was 2003 and 2004 was my first year next door on pit one so right. 20 20 years ago when you started on there mark which is wow that does make us uh feel old but in them days i mean you would join, that was one of the only accessible forty pounders, and it was a scraper, wasn't it? It was forty one, forty two, kind of when, um, yeah, when when we joined. But just goes to show now, like you've got waters near you that you're kind of writing off that have, you know, <laughs> now got forty pounders in, but they're like probably thirties, you know, may, maybe yeah. even maybe even less than that now. Yeah, I must admit, on a, on a normal situation, if I was stuck 
around this sort of area and I couldn't really travel for work purposes or whatever else, then I would be on those waters. Um, but the, 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 the fact of the matter is I haven't got a Pride of Derby ticket. Um, I don't think it's the cheapest ticket in the world. I think it's a good few hundred quid. Um, but it's it's still over 20 miles away from home, so it's not exactly a local water. So in order to get there, I'm probably 45 minutes in a car, mm-hmm. whereas I can do um, Northampton in about an hour and 20, hour and a half, and the fish are another £10 bigger. So that's that's the way I tend to weigh these situations up. If, if I knew I was stuck around here doing day sessions, then I probably would get somewhere a little bit more local. But, you know, because I can travel and, and for an extra 45 minutes, I can be down in amongst upper 40s and, and potentially a 50 pounder, then that's that's where I'd realistically rather rather be. And I, I, I did learn a long, long time, because it's slightly more north of me. I did learn a long time ago never to travel north to go fishing <laughs> because everybody from up north comes down south. And... Um, <laughs> I do the same going further south. So always travel south to go fishing because if, if you go north, of well, one, the fish are smaller and the crowds are a, a lot deeper. Yeah, and if you live in Dover, you've got to fish in France, basically. Exactly. <laughs> I suppose that's only 20 miles away as well, isn't it, if, um, if, if you live on the south coast. Uh, but it's funny how it's changed. I mean, uh, how long have you actually worked in the industry? Um, um I was just trying to think about 2012, I think now, 2011, 2012. Um, I've been a sponsored angler for quite a while before that, and I've just sort of creeped into the industry gradually. Um, I was I worked in the food industry up until about 2011, uh, working in lab management, just um, uh, doing various projects and trials, um, doing that for a living. And then I just all of a sudden decided I wanted a career change and just um, changed, started doing a few tutorials, uh, became a sponsored angler. Um, doing a bit of bits and pieces with uh, the company I was sponsored with at the time, just doing a bit of video work, a bit of photography, and this, that, and the other. And gradually, I've just sort of creeped a bit, bit more into the industry altogether. So yeah, it's uh, from what started out to be a bit, a bit of a bits and pieces job has now turned out to be a full-term career. So yeah, it's been interesting to see how things have changed from that point of view. It's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I've, I've basically I've completely switched vocation from being working in you know in a laboratory to, to now working in marketing so it's uh yeah it's been a it's been an interesting switch do you think it helped you with baits and stuff you know knowing about food and labs and stuff is it is there anything that crosses over there that gives you a bit of uh i don't know easier decisions or anything you know yeah well i used, I used to work in the in the dairy industry so there's a lot of whey proteins kicking around and i was always messing around with uh the the, the we used to do mcdonald's milkshakes there and I was always messing around with the whey proteins uh, and the stabilizers and uh, every, everything I could get my hands on. And I have mixed up quite a few sort of milk protein baits. Um, I found I found some materials I use just completely un- unusable. It just binds the, the mix too much and you, you can't roll it or it just becomes completely sticky. But messing around and, and, and working with whey proteins, you, you soon learn what sort of levels you can put in and still roll a bait consistently without it sticking to everything inside. Um, and it, it was quite interesting, especially in those those early sort of days. But from from a certain period in time, you know, I used to, back in the 80s when I first started and early 90s, I used to roll baits all the time. But I, I can always remember that period when I walked into a, uh, my local fishing tackle shop and found freezer baits in the dead bait fridge. And I was like, wow, this 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 is a game changer here. Heaven. You know, I'm not going to spend two hours rolling a four egg mix before I can go fishing. I can just go to the tackle shop and pick up, I don't know, a kilo or two of, uh, of uh, mainline activators it was at the time. And I just thought, yeah, this is great. So uh, yeah, any 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 sort of ideas I had rolling bait was, was short lived when it was just such a time consuming thing, really. And I just decided that you know, my time was spent better on the bank rather than messing around with uh, with, with baits and rolling things myself. It's um, it's something that people won't comprehend really, unless you've been fishing for that long. But that was a job you had to do. You know, now we get a tackle ready, maybe we prepare a few bits, maybe boil some hemp or whatever. But you had to roll a six egg mix before you went fishing every single time because you used to buy the, you know, you could buy the base mixes and stuff and then add the flavors. But it, it was normal just to buy a ten kilo bucket of, of base mix or Richworth fifty fifty mix and then add a few of your own bits in there with a gardener roller that made 10 boilies at a time you know I, I every single time i went fishing for wow well, god knows how many years you know more than 10 um that was that was part of the routine i remember many times when you could have been at the lake and you know i'm in my flat in watford like ro- rolling baits in a tiny little bedsit that i had then 
just you know dying to get fishing and you literally just making bait to to then go throw it all in and it's, <laughs> you know it's um i know you could always buy bait like um you know we used to buy the, the smoked ham and uh, all the richer tooties and stuff uh back in the early days but I had a paper around there that was paid like two pound fifty a week, and I think boilies were like two pound fifty or something. So I'd literally do seven <laughs> days. Horrible round it was delivering papers just to buy the one bag of boilies. You know, it was. Um, but um, yeah, hundred percent. It's it's ch- it's changed. It's changed a lot. It's a lot more convenient. But I always had so much confidence using me on bait, and I I never ever. Uh, no, that's maybe a lie. I think the Scopex Squid in its in its early days was a game changer. But apart from that, I don't think I've ever bought a bait that's been more productive than the ones I used to use. And there's definitely satisfaction of using your own bait, isn't it? And and I used to change it every time you buy. So you know, to sit on on the tackle shop on the shelves, you used to be able to buy bait making ingredients, and you just sort oh, of try this fish meal this time and add a bit of that in, or um, on, on top of yeah. the standard stuff, and because that milk protein the milk protein baits and the hmvs i mean that that was that was it that calcium cassinate sodium cassinate mm. egg albumin like it was they were all absolute staples uh that you kind of had to have in the bait so have you found an ingredient then that's maybe difficult to roll but if you could roll it you would have it in like it like uh something that works really well but it's just not practical to use it do you ever find anything like that yeah, I, I got onto bird foods at one point, and you were finding quite a few coarse bird foods. And there was one, there's one called PTX, which is like an a, a, an insect meal. You, you probably know what I'm talking about. I mean, I, I did the same as you. I went to the tackle shop, bought various bits and pieces, uh, and we used to just create either, either. Well, in the early days, it was rich was fifty fifty. We started using, and then the old uh, a bit later on, we we created our own base with semolina, soy flour, and then we used to roll um, your bird foods or your fish meals or whatever you wanted to use on top. And there's one called PTX, which I found the fish loved, and it was just basically dried up um, insects. But you could only use it in, in certain amounts, otherwise your base mix would just fall apart. Mm. You know, you did have to have a good degree of binder in there um, just, just to hold everything together. But I, I, I did find that the more I put in, the more, shall we say, attractor ingredients, the, the more bites you would get. Uh, and it, it was quite interesting. But, yeah, you, you had to be a care, especially with the course of bird foods as well. You know, the more coarse bird food you use, it stands to reason that your bait's just going to fall apart, and you know you're not going to be able to put it out with a throwing stick as far, and you know it, it's not going to it's not going to last in the water as long because it's just going to break down a, a lot easier. And it, it is interesting what you say about experimenting with baits all the time, and that, that that's what I used to do. And used to you know get all the different it was it was catch and bait uh, catch them, um, yeah flavorings back then that I used to use quite a lot, and I used to, I used to mess around, and there was a robin red one, and there was the there was a monster crab one that I used to use in swear by. There's a cranberry one and a strawberry EA and all those ones. And I was always messing around to try and find the best combinations of stuff. And I always remember once somebody put me on to foss oil. He said, try foss oil. It's, it's an excellent oil. It will make your base mixes roll much, much better. And the fish just love the oil. And that session I went home, went to the tackle shop the next day, bought this foss oil, meant to put it in the bait, completely forgot to put it in the bait. So I just had my normal bait that I was going to use anyway and went fishing the next day just for a day session down my local lake down Wellesley Lake and I had seven fish and I thought and I normally get two or three sort of thing and I thought I've had seven if I'd have put fossil in that I'd have swore blind that it was a fossil that made a difference <laughs> but because I forgot to put it in and left it sitting on the side in the kitchen it didn't go in I think well how many times do you attribute a, a fish or a string of fish to something you've done when really it probably had absolutely nothing to do with it at all. And it was just a coincidence that that was a going day that, uh, uh, that, that the fish were having it or you got on a certain uh, number of fish and, and that's what made you catch rather than what you're actually doing. It, it does open my eyes a little bit. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that works a lot in the reverse as well. You know, I see it a lot in the shop where, especially with baits and rigs, where people have blanked or had several blanks, they're looking for something to blame. Bait and rigs yeah. are the obvious ones where... In fact, you know, it might just be the conditions are wrong. It might be they're, they've not fished right. They've not got the watercraft. It's in the wrong spot. There's so many other factors other than the bait and rigs. Yeah. No, 100%. I, th- I, think that, I think that goes towards a lot of things. I mean, you guys are in the same position as me now. You've got bait and rigs that you know works. Um, so I, I tend to concentrate on finding the fish and just put in a decent bait and a decent rig in front of the fish. Bait application obviously depends on time of the year. 
but it's for me it's just getting on the fish especially in these low stocks big fish waters that we that we used to fish back in the day it literally was a case of getting on them mm. um so that's that, that's what i concentrate on maybe i'm missing a trick a little bit every now and then i know some of the guys now that are coming into the sport talk about no 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 the, the fishing here like a pink pop-up or an orange one and they keep swapping changing the pop-ups and maybe they are nicking the extra fish that, that i don't get but I always think if I if I stick to something that I know works, either bait wise or rig wise, then I'm I'm, I'm not going to go far wrong. Yeah, it's interesting that you know I've had a conversation with a lot of people who you know manufacturing companies, you know the Nashes of the world and stuff like that, and and they always say you know your average angler, who, you know maybe not so experienced as us guys or whatever, but he goes. Maybe he was never going to catch that day whatever he did, but he goes to the shop, he buys, he tries this bag of boilies. He goes out, he blanks, he never uses that bag, he never uses that one again. He tries a different one next time he goes to the shop. Um, and like I said, it may not be the bait, it's just a personal confidence thing. I didn't catch on that. The next day he had his seven fish, which he probably would have had anyway on any bag of boilies because it just happened to drop right for him or he's in the right swim or the fish are having it or whatever. All of a sudden, that's the best bait in the world. He thinks you know he's gonna, gonna use it forever, uh, or until, until he gets a, a blank run, but. What yeah. you were saying about the colours there, we've we've spoke about this quite a bit on on this, and and with Rob Hughes, um, obviously, I've I've been introduced to that kind of match style fishing a lot more over the last few years because on the continent that's generally uh, how they fish. Um, and they pay a lot of attention to it. They have buckets full of different colour hook baits, lots and lots. And uh, Rob Hughes has backed this up with the diving, so different colours just. In different light levels they just look better you know some are brighter some some are more hidden um so i mean they, they, i've never heard the guys abroad say this but they do change you know if because you because on them lakes you're kind of catching all the time and it's it's equals the effort that you're putting in so you know the more you feed in more you spot in fishing better than the guy next door you know fishing more accurately baiting more accurately maybe a little bit longer you catch more on that day you know and if the guy next door gets up earlier the next morning starts spotting an hour before you he'll have the best day out of the two of you that day you know it literally is the fish are hungry and and they'll go to the fee i mean it's not so stupid easy but the thing is if it, if it goes quiet for a few hours you you automatically just change something because you know like you can do something to get a bite um because you know the fish are there you know if you work hard you know and, and the same thing if you have a lay in and don't start spotting everyone around you as you'll have a crap day you might catch one or two fish you know when you could have caught seven eight nine but if it goes quiet for a bit they'll change the color of the hook baits first thing they do and it may i'm telling you now it makes a hell of a difference i'm looking back thinking how many of i fish have i missed out at over the years because we always fish low stock lakes or we used to there's not that many of them around anymore you know you, you find a little gem don't you if you find like the equivalent of what we used to sort of fish you know elstow 30 odd acres yeah. with 17 18 carp or whatever there was at the time there was next no one fishing it that was the thing it, <laughs> just a handful of you having a go thing. that was yeah difference. you know generally there was a lot of all the big fish lakes were kind of one fish an acre or less you know sometimes one mm. fish every two acres um which was kind of standard all the lakes i fished were were like that so you expect to not catch a lot you know i did 20 odd blank i've done 20 blank nights on a number of different lakes over the years you know in a row without um having to bite but you kind yeah, of expect well. it you know, it's horrible <laughs> you do start <laughs> doubting rigs and bait by the 20th night i can assure you wherever you are and however confident you are you're starting <laughs> to think there's something i can do um but maybe there what maybe there was i mean elster one two was slightly different because I always found if you set up on them, they didn't like it. Like you kind of yeah. had to be there before they were, because um, they were spooky. But that's what you find with low stock lakes. I think if you get on them, they're actually easier to catch than pressured lakes. Um, I don't think your rig bait matters, whatever. But I also think they're more spooky. Like uh, you know, if you chase them, they know you know because mm. they don't get that much pressure. I think it's just a uh, quite a simple thing. But anyway, yeah, going back to the colours. Um, it, you know they'll catch on a pink bait all morning and then the bites will slow up a bit so rather than just think oh the fish have moved or whatever because you know that's probably not the case change to a white hook bait whatever and the bites start again or maybe they just pop up off the lead like 50 centimeters off the lead's quite a common thing they do over there when the bites slow up and bang you'll catch the biggest fish of the session off the deck fish were there all the time they've just decided or they've sussed you or they're just having a break or whatever and then doing something different changing something 
um like induces the bite again so that's got me thinking back to all that fishing that we all did the same sort of fishing for many years i'm like how how much did i miss out on because i was just matching the hatch or using whatever hook bait snowman i was confident in and that was it i never thought of changing it you know i'd change swim i'd move i'd you know try and work out what the fish were doing but i'd never think about colors or anything like that and um, all all the feeding little and often we always uh, i don't know if you agree ed but the uh, the kind of thinking was then is on them low stock slates was as little disturbance as possible so um you did your spot in you know once a day or before dark or first thing in the morning or whenever you sort of chose to do i was used to wait for bite time and then you know sometimes lunchtime early afternoon get me baiting and then you'd sit for 24 hours not touch the rods you know i've been on lakes where i've left rods out two and three days at a time to you know to not kind of create any disturbance and, and again what i've learned is the fish aren't scared by feeding you know spotting um spawning quite the opposite you know broad i've had fish jump out the water to get the spot literally 50 pounders come out after the um mm. after the bait and i think they're there all the time and i think they eat most of it on the drop um you know when you're sort of feeding regularly and i think we always have thought oh certainly i did with my mentality I avoided that style of fishing on the low stock lakes where i actually think it might have not done any harm we spoke about this loads mark but your friend on um st ives yeah spotted 10 key in and was getting liners while he was spotting it and a few minutes after the 10 key went in he had the big one it was there all the time feeding while he was spotting on yeah, a low stock lake and speaking of that lake uh, you've just reminded me of another occurrence it was the uh actually the night before i finally got to the big one i mean before the bus uh, route was there i'm actually stood in the back of the reeds the wind's blowing straight at me and i was spotting from there so i could spot straight into the wind rather than have a crosswind and have it going all over the place I just about uh, got my fill of bait in, and uh, the black pig, second biggest in the lake, nutted about 10 foot behind where my spot was landing. And I, my initial thought was, oh, I best not spot anymore, I'll scare him off. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we've, we've said it loads. Uh, if a fish nuts near your spot abroad, the first thing they do is get the spot out and start putting bait on its head. It's the first thing they yeah. do. Yeah. See, that, that, that kind of goes against everything that... That, that we used I, to fish. I, yeah, and that's what's... <laughs> You know, you, 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 when he was talking about changing hook baits all the time on these low stock waters, I wouldn't do that because I don't want the disturbance. I want the rods to be in. Exactly. I, I want everything same. to be as settled as possible. Um, but like you said, things are a changing now. The, these fish are getting accustomed to it. You know, we're getting high stock waters now, not low stock waters, and they're getting used to the disturbance and the, certainly the spotting disturbance. But whether it's a lead hit in the water disturbance or, or spotting disturbance, it's two completely different things. I always remember being up a tree on Christchurch. Um, and it was about mid-April time, probably, well, God knows when it was, 12 years ago now. And, and I was watching these fish. And they were just milling around. And I, I had a zig out just under the surface. I could see the zig. And there's about four or five fish just sort of milling around this zig. And they were, they were picking the zig up and just blowing it miles. And you're just thinking, how the hell do we hook these fish? <laughs> um, but then some matey dropped up a swim up the way and cast the lead out. And it must have landed. It wasn't even anywhere near these fish. It must have been 100, 120 yards away from the fish. Hmm. But I heard the lead at the water. The fish at heard the lead at the water and they all just kind of spooked a little bit and you know just went they didn't go very far they just went a few foot and then slowly calmed down and sort of drifted and started out a bit more natural and i think mm. is that what it does to these fish sometimes a lead hit in the water even 100 yards away just just makes them spook just puts it, them completely on edge it, it's so, so, it's anything sudden though you know you stand behind your dog and clap your hands it, it will spook you know it's not scared of you but it's it's just a sudden sound that wasn't there a second ago and and like you said they never go far and they always come back you know we learned that from the very first quarter underwater video you know the very first one on horseshoe they they when they were spooking and casting in they they went a few meters away and then came back like every single time but do you reckon somewhere on like elstow or Fendrayton or places like that if you put a lead on a fish's head do you reckon they're going to come back with with all this water to drift off to and there's nothing there and everything clear yeah, to hold know. them and they're, they're not used to that pressure whereas you know your, your, your linears and your, your horseshoes of this world they're, they're going to get a lead on the head no matter which swim they drift into whereas other swims yeah it, other, it, other lakes they could they could just bugger off and not see a lead for days and days on end it definitely makes a difference yeah you're right but that's what i'm saying there's not many of those lakes left now there's so much money in carp fishing who wants a lake with no carp in it and only a few hardcore members when you can you know stock a thousand small carp in it wait five years and before you know it every swim's full you know build build a track around the lake so you can drive your car and you don't even need any fish in it <laughs> it's, it's crazy now isn't it how it's changed but yeah 
are you still finding a few of these low stock sort of waters about? Yeah, I was, I was on one about three years ago. Um, I, I wrote about it a little bit. I called it the forgotten pit, but in, in all mm. truth, it was Waysbury 2. That was fishing. Yeah. Which That's is to which... answer the question if we can name it or not, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's no big secret about the place. Um, it was it was kind of known fishing for God knows how many years. I think a few people were poaching it and whatever else. And mm. just before I fished it, they, they allowed fishing on there for the first time all of a sudden. Um, but these fish were just acting completely natural. And it was awesome to be on a lake like that where it was low stock, not many fish. Um, and you, you could be near enough a mile away from the fish if you got it wrong. But because you could use a boat and drift around the lake, it made it reasonably easy to find them. And, I, you know, providing the sun was out and it wasn't too windy, I could drift around that lake and find a, a handful of fish sitting somewhere that I could have a little dabble for them. And it was, it was great just to fish a water like that. And it was only, you know, like we said before, there's only about half a dozen people fishing it. And, and, and quite often there was... There was me and one other, one other guy fishing there, and it was it was just great to be in that sort of situation, you know, 140 acres between two of you, and it was it was just nice just to just 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 to be back to that sort of fishing again, and and it you know being in that area as well, you know, sort of Waysbury area, sort of there's a lot of history around there, not 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 particularly Waysbury two, but obviously Waysbury one was hmm. there's a lot been written about it, and it was a special special lake back in the day, but you know Waysbury two was was the next best thing to it and there was still a f- few fish around i think there still is a few fish in there that were around back there them days when mary was kicking around or whatever else and because there's been no angling pressure because these fish haven't seen a hook for years on end you know they survived whereas probably the waysbury one fish didn't you know it's mm. as, as much as we like to think we're looking after the fish and we are looking after the fish you know we, we, we really do care for them but you know the stress of catching them probably does reduce their life by not a big amount, but you know, you know, they're probably not going to live to 60, 70 years old or 50, 60 years old. They, you know, they might, they might drift off four or five years earlier, but you know, to have them fish in there that were, that were from that era and just be able to fish it, you know, in a, in a, in a sort of pioneering way was, was absolutely awesome. It was just, it was just nice to take a break from, from everything and just, just, go on fish waters like this and it, it was great and you you know you could fish from islands you could fish from peninsulas and once you're on an island no one's going to bother you on there it's great and you can do what you want <laughs> you know I, I i can remember i was on a three-day session and it was red hot and sorry if this puts anybody off the tee but i, I just i just got naked and and, and uh, <laughs> out of wash and i was just thinking what am i hiding behind this tree for nobody could see me there's nobody yeah. for, around at all and, you, and at the end you, you know you're on this island and nobody at all is going to bother you on this island it's just it's just a great way of fishing, being out in the wilderness. And um, I say out in the wilderness, you're right in Waysbury Village, but you're not once you're out on the islands and out of the way completely. You're not seeing a soul. And, you, you know, you, you're sharing an island with a couple of monk jack deer and, uh, you know, a couple of rabbits and stuff. And, it, and that's it. You know, it's, it's, it's just it was just nice to get back to that sort of fishing for a change. It, it's, yeah. You've done have a... Got them up. Yeah. I was going to ask you about, um, about Raysbury too. You know, in the yeah. stock, we've got some old fish. And I remember seeing pictures years back. There was one called uh, Single Scale, which was up a 30, if I remember. And there was this big, round ghost linear. If okay. I remember, if I remember rightly, it was um, they were caught by uh, Keith Jenkins' son and they were in his article in Cart World. Now, yeah. were there rumours about any of those fish still around or is there a chance oh. they could still be there? Yeah, they, they could be. I mean, Scaly was a fish that was around in them sort of days. And that's... Yeah. I mean, I've lost track of it over the last year or so, but that, that was still kicking around. Um, and that's just a big old fully scale fish. Um, and there was fish in there that we saw that hadn't been caught since the 90s. You know, there was wow. this one called the Twisted Mouth Common that, that we actually saw. And, and one of the one of the lads got close enough to him to recognize the fish. You know, I, we kept seeing it in a certain snag at a certain time of day, pretty much most days. And we'd be up on this high bank looking down into this fallen willow and there'd be quite a few 20s kicking around or whatever else. And then this big fish had just come drifting in between them. And he just thought, yeah, that's that's the big common. And we all knew it was in there. None of us could catch the bugger. It was it was an absolute nightmare. They're, all around this tree, the shallowest bit of water you could find was, was sort of 14, 15 foot and, and silty. And it was a nightmare to just to try and catch anything off there. Um, and on my time on that, I, I, I must admit, I did have one fish off there. I kept it a bit quiet from the rest of the lads, but I did have one fish off there. But most people that were fishing there really struggled to catch off this area. But this one fish was in there pretty much most days. Uh, and it was it was recognised as a twisted mouth common. And that was that was a fish that was 
I think it did upper 30 back in the 90s. Uh, it probably isn't a lot bigger now, if I'm honest, but it's a fish that's not been caught or, you know, for, for, for 20 odd years. And that, you know, to me, that makes it a special fish. Of course, yeah. Maybe there's something special. Something about those low stock waters. So you've done a few of those kind of lakes, Kingsmead Island, where you can use a boat and you're, you know, it's a bit or was a bit lower stocked. Um, you fished Fen as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah back in the day, yeah. Um, obviously uh, the one you're talking about now there's something a bit special it like i don't know if it's it feels like you're pioneering even if you're not you know it's it's a bit more hunter for you versus the fish type scenario isn't it um when you're fishing these big lower stock lakes with the there's something special about it and then um, it does say you know are you always looking for them sort of places are they the sort of places you want to fish uh yeah i, like, I do like a mixture these days um obviously you know n- now that I'm working in the job that I'm doing, then my time is a bit more limited. So uh, I don't know if I could, you know, go on a full-on quest on places like Burfield and, and, and these, the, you know, these, these these proper hard waters these days. Uh, I could probably have a little dabble at them. You know, I saw a fish today that I'd love to have a crack at, you know, not not too far from uh, Fendrate and sort of way. Um, this, you know, this, 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 there is some, still some cracking fish around, but, you know, you're talking that you've got to sort of properly dedicate yourselves for two or three, four seasons to, to even have a sniff at catching these fish. But I, I do like that sort of fishing. I do like to target one big fish. And that's that's been something that's always driven me, you know, just, just finding a photograph of a fish that I want to catch, finding out a bit about the water, going to see the water and thinking, yeah, this this is somewhere I could really enjoy fishing. And Kingsmead Island was one of them. I loved it on Kingsmead. I thought it was great. That whole boating aspect i love fishing from a boat I, I, it just changes everything you know it, you can just drift around the lake and just you can find fish a lot easier from a boat than you can in any 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 time from the bank you know you can climb 101 trees around the lake you'll, you'll find a lot more fish drifting past it in a boat you know you might spook him but the chances are they're probably not going to go too far and as as long as you don't drive all over them uh, and, and properly spook them out of the area if you if you see a couple of fish if you can back off quickly uh, and 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 get a couple of rods on them. You, you've got a good chance they're going to drift back in, or, or uh, you know, drop a rod on the area where you think they've they've pushed into. And it, I find I find it a great way of fishing, and I I really did enjoy it on on Kingsman Island. It was it, it was a great place to fish. It was probably about uh, sixty five acres, something like that. You've got three islands on there, and and all three you can fish from. Mm-hmm. And it, I do like that that fishing from an island scenario. You don't you don't got to worry about anything, you know. You, in an afternoon, you can just leave your kit and just just go wander, you know, just go float around the lake, knowing full well your kit's going to be perfectly safe when you come back. Uh, once you're on the island, you know, no one's going to bother you but other fishermen. You know, you're not going to have public knocking on your knocking on your door. You're not going to have anybody that's a bit untoward sort of walking through like you would in a public park. And you've got to be you've got to be on your toes a little bit in case there's a bit of trouble around the corner. And I, I do like that way of fishing. And and yeah, Kingsmead Island was 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 a special lake. It had. It had known big fish when I fished it, and it also had a bit of mystery. You know, I, I can remember one day um, there was there was we, we had a bit of a celebration because uh, Roy's got caught, uh, which was the, the, the biggest fish in the lake, and it, it broke the lake record. It was fifty four, I think, um, and it was caught bang on the right time of year. It was caught literally just before they started spawning, sort of a, a, a few days if, or a week before they started spawning, uh, and the one guy that had it. Yeah, it was a nice fellow. I'd met him a few times. So we all had a few beers. We all enjoyed ourselves and we all we all celebrated. And, um, you know, during, during that session, you know, I got to know the bailiffs quite well. And we, we actually went to drift around the boat because we were seeing this one big fish in these snags constantly. And I'd seen it on a regular basis. A couple of the, the regulars had seen it on a regular basis, but no one really shared it. But obviously a few drinks are going around and people shared it. So the next day we went out in the boat to, to have a look at this fish. And the bailiff was on the motor. And I got my GoPro under the water on a stick. And as we drifted in, it's like, yeah, yeah, there it is. There it is. Put the GoPro in the water, film this fish. And we, we got back to, the, you know, pushed further into the snag, but he didn't really spook. We got back to the bank and the bailiff's like, that was, that was 45 plus. I said, yeah, it was, it was a good fish. It was a good fish. I, I, I wouldn't completely disagree with him at that sort of weight. And we got it back. We um, transferred the, the, the memory card into my phone and we all watched this fish. And we showed it to everybody that walked past, and not a single person recognised this fish. And it was it was a forty plus fish in a known lake. It was always sitting in these snags, and none of us knew it. Nobody knew it. It was it was just like, well, where's that come from? Why has that not been caught? And it was just still, great still to know. Still not been caught to this day. Not that I know. I've no. I've lost I lost a little bit of touch with the lake over the last couple of years, but 
no, I've, I've not heard of it being caught to this day. So wow. God knows what that is. It's just one of those fish. I mean, I've fished a fair few low stocks. We've fished quite a few of the same lakes over the years. I believe there's fish in every lake that don't get caught. Fendrayton, I saw a group of commons one day. Um, I'm guessing now because it's memory's hazy, but it was a good group of fish. I can't remember how many, 10, 15, whatever. Um, anyway, I saw the humpy common, which was very easily recognisable from the boat. Um, what, what was it called? Humpback common, humpy common? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, they did, did, did 40 odd pounds, didn't it? Yeah, I had it 36, I think, uh, from the pipe swim. Uh, right, okay. but um it it was in the middle of this group and it was an it was a middle size of of this group there were really? fish bigger and fish smaller and it was around that time it was mid <coughs> up mid upper 30 at the time i think um in fact no Basie had had it at 40 pound like 40 pound right. two ounce or something i think it was, have i made that up or did Basie have it at 40 pound an ounce is i think Basie had, had recently had it anyway right. it was in a group of fish that i'd never seen before like every they were all commons and they were all some were a bit bigger and some were a bit smaller there was none much smaller though there was no like 20s in there they're all sort of 30 pluses and there was yeah. quite a few fish again I, I i'm guessing it could have been 10 fish it could have been 18 fish i can't remember now but i remember this group and i remember ringing Basie up and saying look i'm looking at these fish he's like oh yeah yeah i've seen them <laughs> i was like <laughs> what why does no one talk about them i was like there's just a load of fish that could be 40 pound that nobody ever talks about and this yeah. is obviously before that new lot of floods that happened and all the fish moved about again and some vanished and, you know, never seen again. But did you ever see the big common in there, the stripey? No, I never saw stripey. I saw a big, a few big shadows that, that were obviously big fish, but I never saw, never saw stripey. Because I think I was on there literally a year or two after you, so the fish you're talking about were the fish that, that, that I was looking at. Um, yeah. And I'd heard a few stories similar to the one you've just told um, about, because there was there was two big commons in there when I was on there. There was Humpy and there was Basie's Common. I think I think Basie's Common died the year I was on there. I think or the year after something like that. And I, I can remember a couple of people seeing these these group of big commons. So Humpy was one of them. Basie's Common was one of them. And then another three fish that looked exactly like Basie's Common swimming. Because ba Humpback Common is obviously a deep common, yeah. big shoulders on it, uh, big hump. Uh, whereas Basie's Commons were like long, thin. Um, yeah. I wouldn't say lean because they did have a little bit of a belly on, but they were, they were kind of long torpedo shaped fish as you looked at them from above. And yeah, apparently somebody was in a boat and, and a couple of people have, have, have also seen the same group. Um, they saw this fish come through, oh, that's Basie's common, that's humpback common, and, that, and that, that's Basie's common, and that's Basie's common. <laughs> and um, yeah, so there, there was a group of these fish that all looked the same, but they never got caught. And it was it, it's unreal. And I, I did see a few big fish in there at the time. Um, I saw the one that um, Shelley had um, looked nothing like when Shelley caught it, and I didn't recognise it at first. Oh, the uh, the scaly one. Yeah, the scaly one. The big one. And I, oh, I, wow. I, I never saw that. Yeah, I, I, I can I can remember. So it wasn't because I didn't put it at forty eight pounds. You know, mm. cause Shelley had it at forty eight pounds, and um, <laughs> one thing he didn't. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> one, one, one I, I watched he... him. I watched him weigh fish on there, and uh, all of his bum boys will be uh, going back telling him this. But I, I watched him. Well, he didn't even catch the fish from there. He'd had them out of the reserve at the back and then claimed he had three fish in a day out of the reserve and put, put them in fair and he was fishing on that spit between, you know, the spawning bay and the uh, main lake. Yeah. And um, he, he obviously uh, claimed they're from Fen because they went back in Fen. No problem with that at all. But um, watched him weigh him. Ben Manley's were only 24, 25, and there was a pound or two added on to each one. It was just very, very rough weighing, if you know what I mean, water in the right. sling, and just just, just shoddy, you know. And I, I come from, you know, just kind of Roger Bacon, all the Manchester lads taught me the, you know, the de the importance of detail, the accuracy. They they take care with getting the pictures right. They take care with getting the exact weight. They weigh it three or four times, you know, if needed be, till they've got the proper weight. None of that. Like the, the needles bouncing around, that'll do. We'll just call it whatever it is, you know. And yeah. it, it gobsmacked me. I remember ringing Roger at the time, going, I just watched him weigh these fish. And, like, it's just added a load of weight on it. If it's 23 or 25, it makes no difference to an angry of his level capability like he's not it's not 39 he's calling it 41 to get some extra articles which you know he, he's he's admitted 
that he does that, you know, for is it's his job, forty pounds is worth money, and thirty nine isn't, you know, then it'd be a fifty now, obviously. But um, you know, that nobody wants wanted an article for a thirty nine and they wanted an article for a forty. He's a businessman. I totally get that, you know, it's not saying it's ethical for us um for recreational anglers, but you know, if it's your job, you know, there's a lot worse goes on in, in all industries um than that, you know, for money. Um, in any type of industry, just look at adverts on TVs. You know, most of them are complete lies. It's it's like what they're trying to sell you something. You know, Shelley's business was selling himself, and uh, all these bum boys that are going to go back to him telling him this. I'm not having a pop. I, like, I totally get it. And if I was in his position, I'm not saying I wouldn't do the same thing. I'd, I'd like to think I wouldn't, but but I just didn't get why add a couple of pounds onto a 25 or a 26. It makes no difference, like to anything. Like, but I was just like it was, it was just rough and shoddy, and I know there's been a lot of jokes about about all that. But um... yeah, no, I I, I agree. It's, it's, there's no point. I mean, I I've, I've never added weights onto fish whatsoever. And I, I probably could have made a few extra quid. You know, I, I think I had quite a few thirty nines at one point, and and not a forty. Um, you know, and I, I've I've weighed I've weighed fish on my own that have been thirty nine fourteen. Hmm. But that's what I think I've had two or three thirty nine fourteens that I've weighed on my own. Uh, you know, I had one from a uh, local water that was that was uh, thirty nine ten, I think it was, and no, no, no one was around. But you just you're just doing yourself, aren't you? And my 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 conscience would come into play if ever I decided to make money off a lied weight or something like that. Um, I've gone know, the other I, way as well. I've had a fish that's exactly forty, and I've called it thirty nine fifteen just so people don't question me. Really, you know, and I've known it was forty or forty pound at an ounce. I've just said it's thirty nine fifteen. You know, it's just to, to avoid that um, connotation yeah. of, of you're a bit shady or whatever. But, but yeah, I'm but not no, judging I saw, I saw, it. I it's, you know, each to their own. If if it, yeah. if, if your job, your livelihood, your family, everything kind of you know, it's all a business, and you you're in the game, you're playing the game, like, and the game's the game. You know, we're all trying to. I'm trying to survive and and get on, so you know that probably sounds very alien to a to a you know a completely recreational angler. Like, wow, you know that's out of order. You couldn't ever do that, but you know, don't hate the player, hate the game. If if uh, if the magazines come knocking, offer you an extra hundred quid for a front cover because it's a forty, and you know not a thirty nine, and that's your business, how you pay your bills. I mean, it's there, isn't it? <laughs> Nobody's checking up on you, are they? It's um. I think well, you're always someone uh, stuck in the end if if you do that sort of thing because enough people will catch that fish and there's there's nothing to say that fish won't come out. Um, you know you don't know if somebody's caught it a few days before or somebody's going to catch it a few days after and I think you always come unstuck with that sort of thing in the long run and you know I I, I, I could never do that I'd always I'd, I'd always be honest about my captures my weights and everything else and you know I think you end up building a reputation that that people just don't doubt you anymore. Um, you know with with what you catch if you say it's that and it's it's that i think if you get that that question mark over your head and i, I know a few people that are known as dodgy weighers and as soon as there's a couple of fish that you think that that doesn't sound quite right they, they've got that reputation the reputations like that stick from lake to lake to, to, to wherever and i'd i i I'd, I'd hate to, to think people are saying things like that about me uh, it's just you know, I like to think I'm really honest about my captures, and, and you now I probably won't tell people where I've caught it from and what bait I've caught it from, and <laughs> until I've done on that lake and how I've caught it. But um, well, if it's out of the silty area, no one can get bites on, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm honest about my, my captures to, to that degree. Uh, but obviously, you've got to protect. Um, you've got to protect a going method until you, you're actually done on the lake. But no, I like to think I'm, I'm quite honest about everything. I, I you know, I yeah. catch in, in terms of weight wise. It's, it's just not worth lying. Integrity um, is important, yeah. just generally as a human, I think. You know, yeah. um, you've hit the nail on the uh, head there. On in the general scheme of things, uh, carp fishing it's quite uh, quite still a small cottage industry. A, you know, pretty much everybody knows everybody, and like you say, things will come back and bite you on the backside, and you can't shake off reputations of dodgy waiters quite easily. And uh, you know, I've been the same. If you know, I had the twin at uh, 39s when I was after a 40. I cut the, uh, obviously, the lady well under 50 when I was after a 50. But you get to a point is the fish is so much more important than the number that you tag them with at the end. You know, it's uh, about the fish. It's about uh, about the journey. And I remember on, uh, on the world pack when I had the carving, it was first time over 40. It made it by four ounce. And I remember thinking driving home, I'm elated to have caught it, but... There we go. It was a cliquey syndicate as it was. I was getting ready for the barrages. That wasn't 40. He's full of crap. 
thankfully it never <laughs> never came but i was uh, i was expecting it and thankfully the next capture of that fish was two ounce heavier than what i'd had it was like a bit of a relief <laughs> deft as that sounds no, 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 I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. You, you, just, you just don't want that kind of stigma surrounding you. And you, you certainly don't want it to take a capture away. You know, if you've targeted a fish, then, um, you know, you, you spent a hell of a lot of time, effort, uh, money as well these days, you know, just, just traveling around okay. and getting yeah. stuff there that you want everything to be perfect for that fish. Um, and it, it weighs what it weighs. You know, if, if it's 39.14, it's 39.14. If it's, if it's 40 pounds, two ounces, it's 40 pounds, two ounces. And, and, that that's what it that's what it is to me. So yeah, it's it, it does surprise me when people make up weights. But like Jamie says, I, I can see why they do it, but I don't condone that sort of thing. No, it, as I said, integrity is important, you know, and you've got your reputation. It, it goes with you sometimes, you know. If if it's if it is your job, I mean, I, I you know. We were talking about him before um, because you said it didn't look forty eight, but I, I didn't mean to. to yeah. Certainly not yeah, well, attacking him, but it, it... no, I said, I said it didn't look forty eight because it didn't have the gut on it. It was, I think, yeah. whenever he had it, I think it was pre spawning. It was spawning. And when time, I saw it, it was it? middle yeah. of the summer, and it looked a completely different fish. And it, it wasn't until it sort of flanked on its side, looked at me, went right around the boat, underneath the boat, looked at me again, flanked, and then come around in the front of the boat, and there's this little common. I say a little common, it's probably about a, a mid-20 common, and it just got this common, tapped it in the side, and just dragged it off. You know, it, it took a proper look at me. It was unreal. It was like, wow. And I, I, I think, you know, Shelley said something in his, his book about it doing exactly the same thing to him. Um, where, where did you know see you whereabouts, were you? Yeah? I was in front of the Secret Swim, Reminisce Secret, that sort of area. Hmm. Yeah, right, okay. I've heard of one other person. I suppose one other person that said they saw it, but that was um, near where Jim had it from, off off the uh, you know other side of that spawning bay um, sort of side. Uh, one other person, but that was years before I think uh, I went on there. But yeah, you're the first person that said to me has seen it. Um, I think, but uh, I saw the stripey multiple times, as did Dave. Um, he was fishing on there, my mate Dave, and so um, Roger Bacon as well. He came for a guest on there for a week, and uh, that was the day Dave found it. He was up a tree on on the back bank there. I forget the names of all the swims now, but um, there was like a kind of little recessed bay where all the all the scum used to like settle on the surface, and you know you find a little bit of an eddy of kind of still water you know like that that's you know full of like just floating bits on the surface mm -hmm. you know from the trees or whatever there's always fish underneath them where every lake i've ever found that you drift over near there in the boat there's always fish underneath that kind of you know carpet layer on the surface or whatever they just really like it anyway um dave was mooching up trees it was a, it was like a little recess sort of bay thing kind was, of it, was that in between two rebeds just off yeah. the uh... Yeah, yeah, where it came down next to bases. Yeah, yeah I think we made a new swim in there. There was a load of boards in there. They were probably still there after you went. Like, like oh, I can't remember if they were boards or plastic, you know, kind of them plastic square matting type things you get. But we'd we'd basically, um, I think Basie cut the swim out originally. Um, anyway, there was there was a swim either side of this kind of bay. It wasn't really a bay. It only went back a little bit. Um, yeah, I know one. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, again, it's 15, 20 years ago since I was on there, so it's a bit hazy. But, yeah, Dave was up a tree. It was, like, kind of in the middle, and there was, like, a hole in the, in kind of the weed and the, and all the scum on the top. It was all, like, these little white bits, you know, that came off the trees. I forget what they're called. Um, and Dave, I was in the boat with Roger just mooching the lake looking for fish, and Dave was up this tree. Anyway, he rang us. And I thought he'd fell out of a tree and broke his leg the way he was talking. He was... <laughs> like couldn't get the words out he's like anyway it's like, fish fish i've seen this fish like fucking massive and um me and roger i'm like on the phone dave's looking at a big fish we're we're like kind of on the other side um but we've, we've made our way over there and he's talking to us all the time on the phone and as we've drifted in there were two fish on the edge of the bay which I'd never seen or heard of before. Anyway, when I when I described them to Jim, he knew exactly what fish they were. He said he hadn't seen them for like five years or something. Um, yeah. Uh, I think there were two fish. Again, it's very hazy. They were quite long, quite scaly, around the forty pound mark. Two of them um, that looked quite similar together. I forget what they were now. And again, I'm probably getting this a bit wrong because it is hazy. But um, we saw them as w they were right on the edge of the bay, like two really big fish. Um, and then 
this common, I think it spooked or it swam out as we got close to it. We got like a glimpsing view of it as it went under the boat. And I was like, nah, it's not as big as what Dave's saying. Like Dave was describing something that was incredible, like biggest fish he's ever seen, 60 plus sort of incredible, 70 maybe, you know, it was that kind of <laughs> dramatic. Um, anyway, we saw this fish and um, it swam under the boat. But sometimes, as you know, with different angles on fish, you can't see the gut or you can't see the width. Like, yeah. it's quite quite deceiving in water. And I always think fish look smaller than they are in the water. When I see any fish, I always think it's smaller than it actually is when you get it out. Um, mm. don't, don't know what that is, but every every time I've ever done that or, you know, you land in the fish. It must be something to do with the displacement, you know, the light. And yeah, the 100%. I mean, I've got a koi pond, which... Normally, I spend a little, you know half an hour at night with a beer, just just looking into the koi pond, and, and and half the hobby with koi is seeing which ones are growing and see which ones aren't and, and whatever else. And I've I've got several fish that are the same sort of size, and I'm always thinking, oh yeah, he's growing, he's growing, he looks good, but because it's crystal clear water and it's five foot deep, the one at the bottom always looks a lot bigger than the one at the top, and I think it's magnified through the water, right. and I think this 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 sometimes why it makes it look really difficult to tell. Um, fish weights when they're two, three, four, five foot down. Um, because you, you'll see them there and think, well, he looks massive. He's putting on a load of weight. Then you put a bit of food in, they'll all come to the top and, you know, they haven't grown at all. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just that magnification of water uh, if a fish is deep down. But if they're, if they're on the top, I think you get a, a slightly better, um, uh, you know, slightly better perspective on what the size well roger and i saw it again the next day we went looking for it obviously now because it was kind of in this area. It stayed around that area for weeks. Um, Dave and I had a bit of a campaign off the back of it, and we fished either side of this bay. We didn't. There was a swim in the bay, but we didn't fish that. We thought we won't stress them. We'll fish outside of the bay, and there was some big bars when there that ran out from mm. that side as well. It's and not anyway, a roadway, we, wasn't it? It was all the way to the island. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, we picked up over the next few weeks. We picked up five bites. Um, I think we were basically picking that group of fish off. There was four or five fish in that in that group, and then I lost one on the last session that sent me under. That was the, that was the day I fell out with. Shelley, um, I'm, to this day, I think it was the stripy common. We never saw it again after that, but we saw we saw it every week, uh, and I actually saw it from Dave's angle from up the tree, because um, now we started fishing there every week, um, either side of the bay. Obviously, mm. twenty times a day you're up that tree looking for it, you know, seeing if you can <laughs> see it again. Anyway, one time I saw it. We were taking our camera up every time, and you know, for a while I left a camera hung on that tree just in case I ever saw it. And this one time I'd gone up the tree. I'd got down, I'd gone down, stood there for half an hour, I didn't see it, got down, and then I've hung the camera at the bottom, and I've gone up again, and there it was, it was just in, there was a perfect gap, and the fish just, it appeared from one side of the gap, and drove, uh, swam, <laughs> drove across the gap, um, <laughs> And through the other side, and it's the big to this day. It's the biggest fish I've ever seen. I've had fish to over seventy pound, and it was, it was again. Really? You can't always tell because it was in water, you know, two foot under the surface. Which, as you're saying, they look. But I remember the width of it. I was driving an old Peugeot four hundred five um, estate thing. You know, them old square boxy ones like that. Uh, was it bigger ones. than that? It was bigger than. This. <laughs> It had a massive steering wheel. Like, I always remember, it's the biggest steering wheel of any car. So, obviously, you're holding, you know, driving 1,000 miles a week, you know, fishing and back and, and DJing and stuff. So, I'm used to the width of it, seeing my hands on that on that wheel. And I remember thinking at the time, that's wider than my steering wheel, which was an above-average width <laughs> steering wheel, I would say. I just remember wow. looking at it thinking, holy shit. It was a fair, and we, we'd kind of, because me and Roger saw it that first day, um, when Dave saw it, and it didn't look as big from the boat. I always find when you when you see a fish from the boat, they always look small. You know, it, it makes sense what you're saying in your pond. Like the nearer the surface they are, the smaller they look, and the deeper. It's, it's down so there. hard to judge when 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 the, when the boat's moving and the fish is moving. It's just so difficult just to just to try and gauge how big it is. You, you almost like you say want to be up a tree and see the fish from a couple of different angles with you being static and the fish being almost static and just try and try and gauge the size of it off, off, off the weed that it's next to, or, you yeah. know, off, off, off a branch it's, it's, it's swimming past or something like that. Uh, but yeah, when you're just in open water in a boat and there's nothing round for perspective, it's so hard. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it was, a, it was a funny one. I, I still to this day think I lost it on that, that last bite. Uh, Cause we picked quite a few fish off in between. Um, well, I think we had five bites between us over the... That's a good result back in those days, five bites off there. Yeah, I mean, not just me. That was between me and Dave, you know. We, we, but we were picking that group of fish off that were living in that bay at that time, yeah. I think. Um, 
and then I lost one on the last day. I opened the hook, a quarter size size six Y gate when they first come out and I'd just moved oh. off the Fang X's um, which were like you could never open one of them the original ones they were super thick and I was sick I mean I'm not blaming the hook it was the drag was tight it was uh, we were getting the bites at the same time every morning like 7 o'clock it was just as it got light so then I was in the spring so it was lighter than that but the bites were always around 7am every day so just as they're coming into the bag then exactly yeah, yeah. and um and uh, I had a screamer. Uh, we were fishing braid, obviously, because we were towing two, three hundred yards regularly on there. So we were fishing like the Nash uh, bullet braid, which was, you know, the heavy, thick sinking stuff. I think quite. A few yeah, I was on the same thing there. Yeah. yeah, everyone. I think Shelley put us onto it. Everyone used it in them days. On there, it was, it was great for that style of fishing. Apart from uh, when you're fishing three hundred yards and you're leaving the rod out for days and then trying to wind it in afterwards <laughs> wasn't ever fun with that braid. Um, that was a mission to get four rods back in uh, on 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 your last day or whatever before you. It was odd, especially especially if that weed's been drifting and drifted around a couple of rods and knitted them together. It's just oh god, here we go. You almost have to go out for each rod just to just to get it away from the weed bed. And you, you know, by the time you leave, your boat's obviously fully laden. You've got to go out with one rod with the boat fully loaded, smash it through the weed, and then bring that in, then go and get another one. It's it's a nightmare. Tough, yeah. And anyway, um, I, th I think the hook opened on the tape. Really, that the drag was too tight. Obviously, braid. There's no giving it, um, and it was screaming. I could hear the the clutch struggling. You know, I was thinking, bloody hell, it's a bit tight. And as I picked the rod up, I, I was not happy. I was like, wow, this is. It's already had way more pressure on it than I was comfortable with. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't know about you. I never strike. I literally lift the rod up and then slow slow the reel down. You know, it's I, oh, I yeah, never actually it. set the hook or anything. Um, but this, you know, to, with, with the resistance at range, probably some weed on the line, you know, probably had a lot of resistance and um, literally couldn't stop it. Just powered, 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 powered. And then bump, I thought, fucking hell, it's come off. And then when I reeled it in, the hook was just <laughs> uh, walloped. Yes. Ne and I've never felt a fish like it to this day, but it might not have been that one. It, you'll never know, you know. There were powerful 20s yeah. in there, you know. Um, I'll never know, but... We yes, never saw it again after that, you know. No, I, I never saw. I saw a big grey fish. It was. It was. I, I was. I remember. I was drifting down. It was towards Pet Shop Corner. There's like a shallow bar coming off where we used to stash the boats back in those days, and it was in about a foot eighteen inches of water. And I come drifting past. And it was like a big grey fish, and I thought, God, that's an upper thirty. And then it turned head on to me, and I saw how wide it was, and I instantly put another ten pound on it. And that was just a. It was just a wrecking ball of a fish. It was just. You know, as, as as round as you know your 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 microphone cover that you've got there. It was just like it was a chunk. I've, I've heard uh, other stories about that grey one. Basie's uh, seen it a few times, didn't he? I think. Yeah. Um, did it not get caught once upon a time, fifty or something? There, there was there was one fish. Um, I think Matt Bland had it years and years ago. Uh, there was a grey fish, but it was it was a friendly one. It used to come out regular. This was way before mine and yours time. Mm. Um, and it, I think it was an upper thirty or maybe maybe a scrape of forty. And it used to come out every year, a couple of times. If people had, if people would go down, if 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 the, if the lake did, I don't know, six catches in a year, that'd do two of them. Mm. It was it was that sort of fish, apparently, by all accounts. Uh, and then either that one died, and another one appeared that just didn't get caught, or that one just completely changed the way it fed and completely changed the way it react, reacted. I don't know, but I don't know. It, to, to me, it, it probably probably a different fish to be honest to go from that sort of change yeah um to, to, to how it is to how it was you know in my time on there was was, was just unbelievable but I, I noticed a massive change on the lake because i fished in 2006 and i guess you was a year or two before me mm. uh, because your mate dave was on there when i was when i first yeah. started on there and that first year i think i think dave had seven fish and i think the whole lake as a total did 14 or something like that yeah. so you know your mate dave I'd, I'd, I'd half the fish out and then the following year it just changed it mm. was when rob farrant was on there and a couple of other guys were on there and it ended up doing 80 odd fish in a year and these were the same fish nothing <laughs> i mean obviously a few had found their way in from from the reserves by one means or another <laughs> um but it was still the same fish and, and you know fish like marcus is common and humpback common and um big scale and fish like that went from once every two, three, four years to coming out twice a year. And it was like, mm. what's changed? And I, I I don't know if it's a change in the weed cycle or what it was, but all of a sudden they got on the boiling. Or, you know, it might have been years of, of 
gym and, and everybody else whacking ballies in there. And then the fish all of a sudden, oh, yeah, we can live off these. Rather than it's just, what are them around balls? I'm not interested in them. I'll have the snails off the weed type situation. And, and then they just, they just honed in debate. And it, it went from, like I say, 14 or 15 fish in a year to 80 odd fish in a year. It was just, just like, wow, how, how did that happen? You know, why did that happen? You just don't know. It, I've heard that before on these low stock lakes uh, or lakes where I think the fish are predominantly fed on sort of natural food through most of their life. Um, if you remember Colmere, um, yeah, do, yeah. do you know where Ev Terry Earns pal is in his first book? Yeah, um, I, I, I read that bit, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, Ev, um, Ev fished that Colmere for seven years before we're I talking got... Shropshire calm there yeah, we're yeah. Not talking yeah, yeah yeah the Shropshire one I think I've had fished there for seven years um and most years it didn't do a fish I think he'd had one fish one year anyway the year I I had them fish um Ev also uh had the banana and I uh, come every caught others but somebody else caught fish that year as well and Ev said the last time he said so exactly what you've just said about Fen, like he said there was something different that year. He said everything was lively. He was seeing, you know, small fish show that he hadn't seen for years. Like something had happened to the lake in that year. So whether it was a cycle, some food or weed or I, I don't know what it was. But uh, and then, you know, he, he he was buzzing when I caught those fish, even though he'd, he'd you know, ground it out for years and years and years. He was buzzing because he went the catchable well you know i could never be pissed off about you know putting all that time in and someone else catching them he's like now i know the catchable and he did he caught it you know a month or two after i did um it, it but he, he said it was different that everything was alive it just felt like stuff was happening where it didn't feel like that in previous years so i don't know what it is some sort of cycle with the weed or naturals or i have no idea really yeah, God knows. But yeah, I think there and after the fish were just just all of a sudden coming out, and you know, timing on these things is 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 just is is is, is just paramount for these sort of things. Getting on the right water at the right time, and I missed it by a year because I, I'd already pulled off. I'd gone on to um, Lynch Hill and Stone Acres and Christchurch and that. So, you know, I I dropped my ticket by then. Um, and again, I missed I missed Fendrayton again because I reclaimed the ticket in 2012. And I was I was ready for a full on campaign then, but I got uh, I got into a water called Little Urchester, and I was I was fishing on there, uh, and I was after this uh, common called uh, Cuttail Common. They're all commons uh, in there, aren't they? Wasn't there loads of forty commons in there when forties were still fairly rare? Yeah, Urchester. yeah, there was. Yeah, this this what this one I'd after it did forty six, and I fished most of the spring because there's these four lakes on the complex, and I'd done the big lake the year before, and I just wanted to to nick this. Um, Nick, this cuttail common before I went on to Fendrayton, and I, I started fishing there in March and whatever else. And fished through April. I thought, yeah, Fendrayton's not really an April water. It's it's gonna it's gonna kick off royal in May. Uh, and anyway, I got I got caught up after this 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 cuttail for a little while, um, and I got bait, got bait to the punch. Obviously, Pecky went down to to Fendrayton and absolutely clumped it on his little pink bubble smashed at range, <laughs> and I'm like. I was talking to Pecky just before and said, no, I don't really fish in April. Only fish chucks the odd fish up in early April. You, you want to wait till May. It's May that really kicks off and starts throwing the fish up. Anyway, he completely ignored me and he was he was completely right to do so because he absolutely smashed it. it um, that was a different year. That There's a lot more fish been introduced by then, wasn't there? That, that um, yeah. client wasn't in there when I fished it. Um, no, it wasn't there when I was in there. came either. from across the road, didn't it, I think, or one of the local lakes. I know. Yeah. Uh, no, I know where that comes from. I just, I just remembered. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going down that road. Um, uh, but yeah, it was a different year. There was quite a lot more fish in there. But he was catching them from them first swims, wasn't he? As you, as you first come on, he, them three bars that kind of ran out, um, and he, he was just casting singles, wasn't he? At the uh, um, towards what I'm, he's probably written about this, and I've got it all wrong. Um, I can't. I, can't I, I don't. I've got it in my head. He's either on clubbers. Or he was round on the life boy swims on the main bank when he had the majority of the fish, and I know. Uh, he... I, I, I mean, I might be wrong. I had, I had it in my head different. So before clubbers, um, you know, you've got that kind of first swim. You've got that bay, haven't you, where they like turning up every now and again. He did, he, first he did, come on. He, he did just... have a few out of there after he had the client. I think that was a bit later on, just because those floods were the kiss of death for the place. Yeah, and those floods were early May because I I I, I was still on. Um, I was still on Little Urchester. As I can remember being up a tree as the water was coming over the path and the fish were coming right into the bank. So, yeah, and I think he had a few fish just before those floods from that bay. I think he had a fish called Nemo and a couple of others out that little bay. Mm. I think his initial fish, the poached clients and a few of the others, 
and I can't remember if they're on the area of Puffers or Clovers or just around the corner on the Life Boys swims, just smashed out to long range. I know he's fishing single pop ups out at mega range, mm. um, which I didn't cast in them days. You know, when I was there, I had a boat. What did I don't want to cast for. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, he found he, even if he went out, uh, you know, 70, 80 yards and cast 100 yards, he found it, he forced the fish further back. So he was just literally launching it from the bank, um, which I never thought of doing. No, no, he just does seem to have the knack, doesn't he, old Daryl? But um, less about Daryl, more more about you. While we've been talking, I'm just remembering fish that you've caught in the last 20 years. You've got a fairly impressive CV of uh, some of the biggest and best fish in the country, really, haven't you? And I didn't even know you'd fished Urchester. I mean, I knew all about that place um, uh, many years ago. I fished um, some lake in Northampton by that hotel. What was it called now? De- Ransom Road. Ransom Road, yeah. Delacree. Oh, Delacree, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, horrible place. I hated that. Um, just rough. Public park, yeah. Yeah, but unsafe rough I had rods nicked on there it just never felt safe burnt out cars I, I think the car. current from what I've heard I think the current management has sorted it out now and it's a much much safer place to fish but uh, yeah I think I, I don't think it was great back in the day but uh, yeah it's, it's a much better place now uh, but no no I, I, I enjoyed it down there because like, like I say it's about as close as I get to big fish country it's, it's about 70 odd miles away from home uh, you know just straight down the M1 Straight across the the A14 or the the A45, uh, and I'm, I'm there at these lakes, and it's it's just been, you, you know, living in Derbyshire, and, and I know you got well, it's no sub story for me, you know. Are you still, you know, you you're up in Blackpool a lot of your time on year. And, uh, <laughs> to be honest, I drive to Croatia for my big fish fishing, so it's 24 <laughs> hours drive. Um, but listen, from from when you had the mother, which yep. again was an extremely hard fish to catch, you know. Um, Many uh, top anglers, including Terry Hearn and stuff, had to go for that one and, and unsuccessfully. It's a it's an exclusive list of people that caught that fish, wasn't it, over the years, I think. Yeah, Since I think Terry then, lost it. Cause yeah, he, I do. He, he, he described a fight in his book and it fought exactly the same for me. It, it and just... me. I told him as well. I, I said you lost the mother. Um, on, it was his last morning as well, wasn't it, before he left, I think. And I he think never so, came yeah. back, yeah. And I was like, the way he described it, and it was from out the deeps, and we'd learned that the mother liked it 20 foot plus. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, the way he described it. And it went off like a steam train, like mine did. You know, the reel just melted and didn't stop till till uh, I dared try and slow it down. Like, incredible fish that was. Still one of my favourite fish in the country, you know. It's, it's a good one. But, um, just give us a rundown of the sort of the, the big target fish that you've had since then, because you've had a lot, haven't you? I did have had a couple. I went to, um, I, I had a little dabble on Ben Drayton, which, which didn't exactly go to plan. I had a few out, but nothing, nothing spectacular. And then I got offered a Lynch Hill ticket, and that was that was the kind of big turning point for me. I loved it on Lynch, um, you know, and I, I, I was just obsessed by the place. And, and Stone Acres now still remains one of my favourite waters. Again, it's a boating water, but back when I fished that, it was you had to cast and that made the difference. You know, if, if, if you couldn't cast or if you couldn't cast accurately, it, it put a lot of people off and you, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd got a lot of the bars. There was, there was kind of two bars that run up and down the island, uh, the back of the island. And, and the furthest bar was between 140 and 160 yards from the bank. And you went out there in the boat and looked down at the boat. And this, this bar was about eight foot wide and, and reasonably long in places. And you think, yeah, I can hit that. It's not a problem. So I'd put one H block at the back of it and two H blocks at the front either side. I thought, yeah, I can land a rig on that. And then you go back to the bank, look at it, and it like all three were in a line. It's like, oh, shit, this is going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, you used to want flat, calm conditions. And then try and judge if if if, if that splash was in between these, these, these three H blocks or not. And then you go out in the boat, have a look. It's like, bugger, I've overshot it. And you can see the line go over the top of the bar and disappear into the weed. Or you couldn't see the line at all. You just sort of disappear into the bar and from sorry now you have to go and redo it again redo it. and i spent hours i spent four five six seven hours getting two or three rods sorted on that on that bar so it was a nightmare but i really enjoyed that lake and i had, I had some real stunners from there i had you know some cream of the crop i had um the number nine bus twice absolute belter um still one of the best fish around i think mm-hmm. and that's that's still going um, I had uh, I had a fish called Trop Scale, I had a fish called Gold Shoulder, which I've been out for a couple of years. Um, I had a common, and it wasn't it wasn't the biggest common in the world. It was thirty three, but 
that hadn't been caught for a long time. And I think Scott tells a story about it when he had it a bit later on and just before spawning at, at 38 or whatever else. Um, and then I had, I, I had the two big ones. I had bite mark at 48, mm. um, which is an absolute pearling fish. But the one I was actually after, the one I joined the lake for was Choco. Mm. Choco was just mm. such just such an awesome fish just the coloration of it um you know the shape of the fish it was just such a classic mary type fish you know it was just 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 awesome and that 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 was that was the fish i really wanted and it's still probably my, one of my favorite captures to this day um so yeah i absolutely love that um so i had a great time on there I, you know i had a little dabble on christchurch didn't really fish it that much but i had baby paul is at just under 45 that was a nice fish and i've had mm. some of the others like the box common and uh, uh one called hartley's which i think is one of the big ones now and a, a few of the other commons uh, so i really i really enjoyed things across on on lynchy i thought you know it's, it's it's a fabulous complex and i think you'd struggle anywhere to get better looking fish than than over there they're just yeah. absolute pearlers so no really, really enjoyed my time over there um i had a little dabble for for a fish that both of you two have caught yeah. um the fat, it, the, the fat one, the fat one, yeah, fifty. <laughs> yeah, I, I did see it on a bank on its last ever capture, um, but you know, its last ever capture does tell a story. It it, it died um, that first year I had the ticket. I, I literally did four nights on the place, saw it out at mm. fifty seven, and it just looked it looked amazing. I think I think you've had it bigger yeah. than that. Was it fifty nine or sixty when you had it? Fifty eight, ten, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's such a such a massive. You see pictures of it, and you think. It looks nice, but then you see it on the bank, it's like, wow, <laughs> that's that's something really special. Um, I, I saw it on my first session, somebody caught it opposite me. They were in Dave's, I think, and I, I was on uh, whatever that swim opposite the beach. Um, yeah. And I knew it was chucking it down with rain, and I seen him playing this fish for ages, and I seen the splash. I walked around, I was like, I'm, that's a big and it's got to be. Just seeing it, I, I mean, it was 46 then, which was still one of the, uh, no, no, that's a complete lie. Fifty four. Oh, no, my head's gone. I'm not getting older and see now. Uh, but anyway, I just remember looking at it and thinking, "Wow, I need to catch that fish." That's just. It was just an impressive sight. The width of it, the size of it, I was just blown away. And there's no more motivation you need from a lake is it to see like the prize right at yeah. the start on your first session. You know, it was my second day. It was just like, "Wow, it was an incredible yeah. fish." It, it was. It was a stunning fish. I mean, there's a lot of fish that size or bigger now in England, but. You know, looks like Sir Grenville's probably a load of fish bigger than bigger than that now. But that yeah. that was one of the biggest. I think when I caught it, it was the third biggest fish in England at the time. I think uh, certainly known ones. You know, I'm sure there's there was the. It, it, could, it could have been one of the biggest living fish in the, in the country at the time. Yeah, I think you know. I think two tone had two tone died when you caught it. Uh, no, nah, two tone was still about. I think. Oh, maybe actually, I don't know. I can't. Remember. I remember working out at the time. I think it was the third biggest fish in England. Um, well, and, and no one expected it to be as big as that that year. It just kept getting bigger, didn't it? That particular yeah. year. Um, yeah, Mark had it like oh. six weeks before me, like twelve pound lighter. You know. Oh, well. uh, I'll tell you the story. I had it the first of August at forty six. Spawned out. It looks a lot better at a fighting weight. I've always said. <laughs> and um, it only did one capture between me and you. And that was one of the local lads. I can't remember his name, but he had it at 56. That might have been three or four weeks before you had it. And then you had it 1st of November, 12 weeks after I'd had it, at uh, 58. Mm. Wow, colossal fish. Yeah, yeah awesome. it was an impressive fish and a friendly one. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, <laughs> it took me 60 nights to catch it. <laughs> but, um, you know, it did make up kind of, well, that and the pig made up. 50% of the bites every year, you know, on the, on the lake. There's the small ones that are hard to catch, you know. They, they were once a year, once every two years, um, fish. Yeah, I was just upset I didn't do a proper campaign. I did, I did, I had that little dabble in the spring and it come out, at, like I say, 57, and that was its last capture. And then my lad was born um, in, in June, so I had to have some time off. And then I think that fish died in July. Um, so I never, I never really had a proper go at it. I just did, like I said, I just did four nights and, just slowly getting my head into it and, and formulating plans for, you know, for once my lad had, you know, grown a little bit and I could I could leave a missus a bit more, um, but yeah, it just, yeah, wasn't meant to be. It's just one of those things. Um, so yeah, I had to, I had Where to leave that behind. <laughs> um, I had the urge to stick it at the oh, same right. sort of time. Um, so luckily, I had a fallback plan. Mm. Otherwise, I'd have been in proper trouble. So I, I had a few out there. I had um, 
Uh, I, had, I had the big mirror at forty. I had uh, the well, it was a, it was on it was on bonfire night. I, had, uh, I, I was fishing maggots. Um, I found this tiny, tiny hole in the weed. I must have had. I, I was I was determined to get a rod in this area because there was like a there was there was a channel uh, into into a part of the the, the the lake called the pond. I didn't want, and the fish were in the pond. The pond's probably about an acre in size. But I didn't want to drop in there on top of them like what we discussed before. You know, if I dropped in there on top of them, they probably would have spooked them out. But I knew they had to come out. So there was a channel, and it was right underneath the electric wires, and it was an area that nobody really fished that much because it was it was kind of between two swims and kind of a bit dodgy with the wires. Um, but in the middle of this channel, there's a plateau that came up to about two foot deep. So there was, there was a two channels within one channel. And I thought, right, I want that far channel from this angle that no one really fishes. And I'd had 20 or 30 casts, and it was just weed, 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 weed. And then last one, I thought, one last cast, donk. I was like, right. And it was a channel. It must have been less than a foot, well, probably a foot wide, let's say. And I thought, that's it. I'm, I'm fishing that. So um, I fished that that night. I had a 34 uh, the first night. And then the second night, I hooked this fish, and it just beat the hell out of me for, for 40 minutes. And, and halfway through the fight, I just thought, actually, I've got a size 10 hook on this rod. <laughs> I don't really want to be. I don't really want to be doing this for this prolonged battle. Uh, but then I landed it, and um, the hook was so buried that was never coming out in a million years. It was pretty much down to the eye. And uh, yeah, I landed a, a forty-four. I think it's forty-four four or forty-four and a half uh, fish called um, called the parrot. It's just a, a big lump of a fish. So yeah, really pleased with that one. Um, I then carried on. I had oh, then I had the immaculate common, which was two ounces under forty. And then the following year, I came back and fished the car park lake. And that was just such a, a tricky little lake. They, they knew everything in there. Mm. Um, and I, I had a couple of fish out, and the same fish twice in consecutive sessions, which was weird, saying it was a once-a-year fish and barely came out. But I had that twice in consecutive years. And then I found the fish visiting one area on a consistent basis. And I just they were just so spooky. They could find the line. They could find the rigs, everything. Um all the time so i knew i had to do something a little bit different um so i, I was i was kind of fishing down to a, a sort of area there was there was like a little bay a little long thing bay called the keep net and it was about i don't know rod length and half wide and they travel up and down that i thought i don't want to be in that because it's a bit too obvious and there's not really a swim in there but i could have stalked them out there or just created a swim or done whatever but i thought i want to hit them on the way out and as they came out there was like a little, there was, there was a load of reeds and it was all reed lines. There was a little bar that came out that was clear. I thought, I want a rig on that bar. So I put the rig on that bar and they were coming around. They were seeing the bait, they were swimming around it, seeing the line and spooking off. I thought, right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll fish it from a different angle. So I'm fishing more or less along the reeds. So I fished it along the reeds, tried it from that angle with the rod further down. And the fish were just coming around, coming between the reeds, getting stuck between the reeds and the line and just spooking. They were straight out there. And I thought, how do I get around this? How do, how do I do this? Because they're, they're, they're getting away with it. So what I did was I went down to, waded down the bank, under on flicked it onto this bar, climbed up the tree to see the, fit, the, the, the rig and everything was on the bar, just with this little bag. Saw it was on the bar, looking good. And I thought, right, I'm going to back lead into the weeds. I was only sort of 10 yards out, so I back it into the weeds. And I, instead of putting the rod right down there where it was awkward to get to and, and uh, almost chest deep to get to the rod, I put a, a storm bar in there with a little line clip and walked it back to the swim and put the rod on the swim. And um, nothing happened the first night at all. Nothing happened the first day, but the fish were in the area. And I'd, I'd seen the fish milling around and I'd watched these few fish come around the swim and the big one was in there. You know, Cocktail was there with them. I thought, that's that's it. He's in the swim. That, that's good. And it comes to about six o'clock at night. I had a bite, which was really annoying because they were, they, were, they were all over me for about four or five hours. So I got up the tree that I was, uh, the, 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 the sort of watching tree, and I was looking around, and I saw a few fish disappear down to the keep net uh, swim, keep net sort of uh, bay. Watched them swim around there for a bit. Saw them come out around this channel, and up, six of them sort of came down to the to the base where my storm bar was. And one of them turned around and went back. And I thought, which fish is that? I thought, that's the big one. That's the big one. And it went down right over the top of the PVA bag. And I was watching it. I think, go on, go on. And it, it come up took a few mouthfuls, come up, shook its head and shot into the reed. It shot towards the reed. I was like, damn it, it's done me. And I thought, oh, no, and then it shot back out again, looking really spooked. And I just saw the line pick up 
<laughs> off the off the storm. I was like, ah, and for, jumped and fell and whatever down this tree, run back to my rods, hit into this fish. And uh, yeah, landed it at, uh, it was a little bit down in weight. It was down at um, 43, 12 or something like that. But yeah, the, the, the way I caught that fish was, 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 was unreal. And then that night I went, I did the same thing and went on and caught a 24 and then I caught the biggest mirror in the lake, which was about 34 at the time. So yeah, I'd had, I'd had a bit of a session just by working out how to mm-hmm. catch it with line angles and, and backletting into the weed just so they wouldn't see it. And yeah, that, that made the massive, massive difference for me. Massive difference. Yeah, you just get weird bites, don't you? Because it like pivots off the back lead, doesn't it? So you know, it was obviously hooked all the time, wasn't it? When it ran into the reeds and ran back it, out. Again. Yeah, it was. I just thought it had done me. But yeah. yeah. Then I saw the line pick up, and then it pulled out the clip by the time I got to the rod. Sort of thing. <laughs> so where next? Obviously, I know you. Um, you fished the Island Lake. You had a big one out of there, didn't you? Yeah, I was lucky enough to get the big one out there. I, I actually <clears> went for the common because <throat> uh, I think um, uh, Jim Hepper had it. Who was. Who, he was on, might, might have been on Fen when he was on Fen. He was, yeah, I know, Jim. Yeah, lovely chap. Yeah, he was on so... the St. Ives Lagoon when we were as well. I've never met him on there. Oh, right, OK. Yeah, I, I met him on Pingewood when I was having a little devil on Pingewood when yeah. Burfield was fishing rock hard one year. Uh, I'd, I'd done a few nights on Pingewood because when you, when you couldn't find him on uh, Burfield, you could just drop on Pingewood for a night because you knew roughly where they'd be in the same sort of area. Hmm. You know, I spent that many, much time on Burfield when... It had been overcast and windy. And you just you just couldn't find find them all. They were just out in the middle of the lake, and you know just just too far to chuck to. So I, I, if 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 that was a scenario, I'd just drop on Pingewood for a couple of nights and Did I met one the there. Pingewood biggins. No, I, I didn't really do that much time. I, I I just I think I only did half a dozen nights something like that because hmm. uh, I, was, I was too busy concentrating on Burfield and trying to get the big one out of Burfield, which was awesome. Water Burfield was absolutely yeah. fantastic, uh, and I, I had some of the nice fish out there. I had. Um, I had four or five of the known 40s out there. Uh, it's just I happened to catch a lot of them just after spawning, so there was like 38, 39 sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then some of them fish have now gone on to do upper 40s, and I think one of them that I had at 38 has done 50 now. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 such an awesome water uh, and then such a phenomenal place. But I just got bored of. I did 20 odd nights in one swim, and that's why I just got bored to tears of the place. Wow. You know. When the first year I was on there, it was mega interesting. The fish were getting down into the dog leg. They were down in the shallows. They were down in the little bays. And you mm. could creep around and climb trees and find them. And I found that fishing absolutely phenomenal. I just found it really interesting. And I loved it down there. And I really enjoyed that sort of style of fishing, just just walking around, finding them, just creeping around and then setting up on on points that took you off, you know, basically an hour to get to because you had to unload your, broly, uh, unload your barra twice to get there, mm. you know, over fallen trees and whatever else. And I just found that really good fun. But the second year I was on there, it got really popular and it got really busy and there was loads of people fishing these these little bays and it just forced fish out into the central part of the lake. Mm. And it was just a bait and weight tactics. And I, I caught quite a lot of fish. I had 30 odd fish that second year, 40, 35 fish, something like that. But it was just boring because i was just fishing the one swim and baiting this one swim all the time and i just thought this ain't for me there's just no excitement in it you just you're just waiting for them if you you know part part of it for me is finding them and catching them whereas baiting and waiting you just there's no point watching the water you're just waiting for the rods to go yeah you, know, you could see them across the other side of the lake but what's the point in moving because there's either someone across there or you, you can't fish that area so you're just waiting for them to drift onto you so i got a little bit bored of the place but that first year really was exciting um so anyway, I fished. Yeah, I'd, I'd seen Jim Hepper with uh, the big common out of the Island Lake at 51, and that's what made me want to fish the Island Lake. And I'd sort of gathered a bit of information on the place, and I'd found there was one called Two Tone at 49, there was one called Royds at 48, and this common at 51. And I was lucky enough to catch the common pretty early, uh, you know, within my first sort of 20 nights on the place. It, it was down in weight at 46.10 when I had it. Uh, but I was still absolutely blown away to catch mm. it. Uh, it's such an awesome fish. Uh, and that session, was, I went out to, to, to have a look at the spot I'd caught it from after I was packing up, and I found a dead fish in the weeds. Uh, gathered a couple of lads, and it was it was one of the ones I wanted, two-tone, mm. uh, which was a little bit gutted. Uh, but I decided to stay on for Royds anyway, because um, Royds had been out at 48, but it looked a bit empty, and everybody was saying it was it was much bigger fish than that. Um, and it did... It, you know, just I told the story earlier. It came out at, at um, four, 54 in the spring, just before spawning. It was such a massive, colossal fish. And then I mm. caught it at um, 50 pounds an ounce after spawning in August. 
Um, and I was, I was just blown away. You know, I tried for years and years to catch a 50 and I had Chucko at 49, 12. Uh, I had a big fish from Derbyshire at 48. I'd had Bite Mark at 48. And I had so many fish at upper 40 mm. um, that I just never managed to break the 40 pound barrier. I'd always caught them at the wrong sort of time. But a bit like you, Mark, with the, with the lady, I'd, I'd never... I'd never caught the right fish at the right sort of time. Um, so I was just blown away to catch a 50 after, after all those years. Uh, and I was, I, was, I, was, I was really pleased to catch it. Um, and then that year I went on to St. Ives. I got myself a St. Ives ticket and went on there. And I, I really enjoyed it down St. Ives on the Shallow Lagoon. Um, you know, oh, yeah, you had Colin, like Colin, didn't you, as well? Yeah, I had Colin that, that, that same year. Um, but, but yeah, my first session on St. Ives, I had five fish. You know, I dropped in a swim called the Cops and just saw them showing in, in, in the deep air, I think, in the double swim. So I moved around to the double swim, roughly where they were showing. I had a load around and found a load of eelgrass. And, um, yeah, I had five fish out of the eelgrass in, in two nights fishing. In fact, I was listening to you guys on the Carp cast uh, when I had two of the bites <laughs> at, at night. I, was, I, was, I think I was sitting and listening, going along, and then the plug went whizzing off. And uh, I had to rewind it and find out where I was and uh, where I was listening to when, <laughs> when I had that. But yeah, really enjoyed my time on there. And I, yeah. I, I ended up catching that fish out the, out the cop swim. And that fish could that fish could go. That fish really could go. Did, did you, you had it, Mark, didn't you? I didn't know. I seen it. Uh, I seen it on the bank when Paul Rudd had it at 46, but that was as close as I came. But. Oh. Um, my time on the shallow, we had like, um, you know, two different spurts at it. One, you know, after I'd caught the lady and had nowhere else to go. And, you know, Colin back then was like, you know, 36, 37. You know, I wasn't, I was just playing at it, not really uh, taking it too seriously. Yeah. And then, you know, I went back on uh, after fishing the late round the corner. And right, to be honest, when I was on the late round the corner, I spent half my time up on the uh, shallow lagoon with, uh, you know, one or two of the lads on there drinking. <laughs> as you do and I thought yeah. I'm going to have to have another devil on this place and um, I'd, uh, I had a few I had, to be, I didn't have Colin but I did have one that I really wanted one that you caught as well Spongebob oh right yeah, yeah that was one of the classics I mean correct me if I'm wrong but that first session you had on there is that when uh, I had driven down to Monk's Pit only to find it spawning and Gordon let me do a couple of nights on the lagoon was, it, was that the first night I can, I can certainly and, uh, remember you down there. I don't know if it's my first night or not, but I can yeah. certainly remember you down there. Is I that when I had Spongebob, you, was it? I can remember you catching Spongebob while I was over on the lagoon, yeah. Uh, you, yeah, yeah, it would have been my first session then. Yeah, because I had Spongebob on my first session. Yeah. Wow, SpongeBob that's a nice fun. welcome to a lake, isn't it, when you, uh, you have a hit like that, you know? Yeah. With, with sort of good average size fish as well, it's like you know this is this is a bit of me and it you know quite often you have to work a lake out and spend nights and nights and nights before you get you know the first one you dropping on <laughs> dropping first session five fish you know and you know there's some kippers swimming about. I'm presuming Colin was fifty, was it when you had it? Yeah, it was fifty. Yeah, it was. It? It was yeah, I can remember. Um, uh, I, it was. It was. Yeah, it was an in, interesting capture because I'd, I'd got three nights ahead of me. And I'd found a load of fish in the outer bounds area, you sort of wade around onto this island and climb a tree on an island, and you can see them sitting there. And I'd also seen a load of fish in the central part of the lake. And it was a Saturday night when I first got down. I thought, where, where shall I drop in? This I, I couldn't get the centre of the lake because it was busy. Uh, I, I, and I thought, shall I drop in hole in the bush? And I thought, no, it's a bit precarious around there. So I thought I'd drop in a swim. I can't remember, is it called a garden? I can't remember now. Anyway, you've got a load of pads at about 70, 80 feet yards in front of you and the fishing. There's, there's two ways of coming out. They either go up the side of the island and, and end up um, at end of island swim, that sort of way, or they come through the pads towards you. So I thought I'd, I'd, drop, in, I'd drop in the pads and if they're still there the following day, I'll, I'll go in the end of the island swim. So anyway, I dropped in the pads and done that first night and then Sunday morning the place emptied um, and there was, there was ended up as one other guy in the lake and... Uh, and I sort of, oh, I don't want to wind in too early. I just, so I left the rods out until about 10, 11. And then wound the rods in and went around to claim end of Ireland. And this guy had already moved in there. And I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, he'd, he'd beat me to the swim. So I thought, right, what can I do now? I'd seen the fish showing out in the centre of the lake. Um, and I'd seen him in this outer bounds. I'd not seen Colin in the outer bounds, but I'd seen a few others. <clears throat> so I thought, right, I'll drop in the cop swim and I could still cover the, the garden snack, uh, the garden pads. Uh, providing no drops in the garden because it's only about 80 yards away and then i can i can put a couple of rods out in the center of the lake where i would seen these fish show um and i i've been watching them in the in the in the, in the out of bounds area quite a bit and i actually had two bites from 
out in open water. I think two mid twenty or mid twenty and upper twenty. And one of these mid twenties was one that was in the outer bounds. So I'd seen it in the outer bounds and caught it two hundred yards away in the <laughs> in the mm-hmm. centre of the lake, which which was kind of weird. Um, and then my my last bite was one off the pads, and I've been baiting these pads for three days, obviously because I've been fishing it. And uh, every time I put boilies in there, the swans were a nightmare because it'd be in shallow. The swans were just straight on it. So I'd, I'd switched to using broken boiling and a lot of um, hemp, and I'd use the, the, the sort of hemp out of a tub, which I'd, I'd never really used before from mainline. Uh, so I'd, I'd spotted two tubs of that out there just to keep the swans busy, but also to keep the fish um, active and on it and picking it up, you know, without making it too obvious. And um, in the night, I had this this take, and saying I was fishing tight to the snags, with a pretty locked up spool, you know, I tend to fish locked up just before the rod goes in. The, you know, mm-hmm. it can take a bit of clutch, and it started taking clutch. Uh, and I, 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 that's the last thing you want to do when you when you're fishing pads. And the the, mm-hmm. the rod was absolutely crippled around in the rests, virtually, you know, not, <laughs> you know, an, a, another sort of, you know, a few ounces of pressure, and that rod was gone. But I've just managed to get to the rod in time, get it out the rest, and just try my best to to, to get this fish moving. And it was it was it was just it was a proper war of attrition. It still took line off the clutch. I thought if if I give it any more, something's giving, mm. something's giving. And it was just one hell of a fight. And I managed to turn it, and I could feel it coming back through the pads and cutting the pads. And luckily, I'd gone to braid, uh, you know, a good high quality sinking braid, and that managed to cut through a lot of the pads because mm. by this time it had gone about ten yards into them. And I, I, it was one of these that you just couldn't stop. You know, you sometimes just get these fish, and it just wasn't stopping. And <sighs> You can you can never be hundred percent sure it's the fish that you're after, but I know I, I was pretty confident it was that fish just by yeah. the way it was going. You know, I spoke to a few people that caught it, and Miles Gibson was a mate of mine from Stone Acres, and he said when he caught that fish, there was never any point in that fight he thought he was going to land it. He said it was either going berserk, smashing through weed beds, or head and shoulder out of the water and just thrashing on the top, or flying towards a snag, or doing whatever. <laughs> And it did the same for me. It just went absolutely bandy. And I, I just I just had to give it pretty much everything I dared give it um, just to get it away from those pads. And and I just had to let it go bandy in open water. And luckily, I slipped the net underneath it. And, uh, yeah, I was just blown away to see it. It was just such a colossal fish. Uh, and the hook fell out in the net. And um, it wasn't in particularly good condition. The hook wasn't. <laughs> so I, I, I was literally, if, if I'd have played that fish any other way, I wouldn't have landed it. I, I yeah. gave that. The exact amount of right pressure to to turn it but not to straighten that hook anymore and then i got it on the scales and i had roids a month earlier at 50 pounds 50 pound 12 and then i weighed this fish and it was like 50 pound 12 i thought no it can't be 50 pound 12 and i looked at the scales a bit more i thought yeah it was slightly under so yeah 50 pound 10 it's <laughs> i just couldn't have two two pbs at the you know at the same sort of time and yeah, I was just blown away to catch that fish, and it was it was such an awesome looking fish. Um, you know, it, I know it's a bit chunky and a bit deep bodied and whatever else, but you know, a fish that had been around for for such a long space of time. I remember being on on, on Fen Drayton back in two thousand and six and seeing pictures of it in carp talk and, and having it in my mind from then to have a go at it. And then you know, when when the when the lady got caught, I went and had a walk around just about with everybody else from St Ives as well with the same sort of idea. I think it was forty then. Uh, low to mid 40 then um so i had it on my radar for years and years and it wasn't until it turned 50 that, that i thought the time was right to go and target that fish and it was just just such an just such an awesome fish and believe it or not i went to walk around nobody else on, on the lake at all couldn't find anybody else on the complex gordy was down but i thought he was fishing the far end of um uh, of, of meadow and fjords so there's one guy on the lake and i went around to him so like, i've got a couple of fish mate can you can you do some photos so no mate i got the rods out yeah, but one of them is Colin. No, mate, no, I'm staying here. No I'm, way. I'm like, you are. No, name and no, shame. Mate, no. I'm like, I, I don't know his name. I don't know his name. <laughs> it was, uh, and I'm like, so somebody did tell me his name, and I thought, if ever I see him again, I'm, I'm having words. He wouldn't come around and take photos. I'm yeah. like, it's a fish of a lifetime. It's more or less you know, a one for... fish water, and I've got a 50 in the sling that wants photographing. The lad won't come around. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, That's I think a bit his name was Guy or, or something like that. <laughs> I so. mean, no, no one likes but. reeling the rods in in that situation, but you kind of have to, like, yeah. or or leave them out. You know, I don't think it's really a bad offence, is it? Depends how far away you are, I guess. But... It depends where Gordon is, whether you're going to get caught or not, I suppose. But yeah, um, when you're in that situation, 
you know, why didn't go take a picture? Because hopefully one day you're going to need that picture taken and you'd like someone to come around and do it for you as well. So, well, if you yeah. ever, ever intend fishing that lake, it's the best bit of information you're ever going to get. You're going to go into the oh, swim, exactly, yeah. you're going to see yeah. which rod the guy's had it on. <laughs> you know, you're going to chat to him a bit. He's, not, he's, he's just had the fish. He's not going to be too secretive when you're there doing him a favor. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just win, 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 isn't it? Like, why well, wouldn't you do I, it? I, I didn't care then. I'd have told him everything he wanted to know from catching every single fish, working at every single spot, doing doing everything I possibly could. Mm. And it, then, then it doesn't matter anymore because you're never mm. going to fish the lake again. You know, you've caught the fish. It's, it's all done and dusted. You're in a bit yeah. of a euphoric state. So, yeah, yeah it, it, it's unreal. You know, I've, I, I'd wind in for anybody catching a target fish knowing that they've done it. and I'm liable to glean a hell of a inform- load of information off them for, for doing I, that. I, I don't understand the type of fishermen. You know, if you say you're a sort of true angler and you must be to fish them sort of lakes, you know, they're not um, they're not commercials, are they? Um yeah. Who wouldn't want to see that fish? It's like you're fishing on on Yately and Car Park Lake and Heather the Lever or Arthur got caught and, you know, everybody yeah. would reel the rods in and go and have a look at it. Like, yeah. this is the, the dream. It's what you're there for. And it's like to, to see that fish. Yeah. It's all part of it. it. Lights the fire, gives you the excitement. It's it's like, what what carp angler in their right mind wouldn't want to see one of the you know most special fish on the complex? Probably the most special fish on that entire complex at the time. Yeah. And, and that's it. It's, 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 it's ten pounds bigger than anything else in the lake at the time. It, it's if you're fishing that lake, you're fishing that lake for that fish. I mean, you have secondary targets and whatever else, but you're you've you've joined. You've found out about that lake for that fish. Yeah. And and why you wouldn't come and take a photo of it i don't know <laughs> yeah. funny breed some carp anglers says some are just jealous they're resentful when other people have success you know i'm sure you've come across yeah, that as no well i mean you, you you're one of the nicer guys in uh you know long time anglers in carp fish i've never heard a bad word said about you ever but i'm pretty sure there's no way you can have fished the lakes you've fished and caught the big ones from lots and lots of lakes there's, you must have experienced a bit of resentment along the way oh yeah loads loads and you you don't tend to find out about it until bit later on because it's all backstabbing nobody says anything yeah. to your face and whatever else and I, I had a bit on Urchester and I never really realized it too much at the time until people told me after the event but I was getting slated for one thing or another and, and mm. ba- basically I, I'd like, like I said before when when the lady uh, died uh, you know my, my son was born so I had next to no time to fish the lake that summer so I was just nipping out whenever I could um, doing one nighters, and I was putting way too much bait in for one night. You know, I was fishing over five, six, seven, eight key um, just to get some baiting because I wanted to get a bait established. I was using a, a different bait at the time, one that I'd, I'd kind of helped develop uh, and produce. And then if there's nobody on the lake in, at, at one end of the lake, I'd, I'd pile a load of bait in. Even if I thought mm-hmm. there's no carp there, I'd just pile it in just to get the fish on this bait. Um, you know, and I, I certainly wouldn't bait up anywhere near anybody else and i wouldn't i wouldn't do anything to upset anybody but if the lake was empty mm. you know quite often you're leaving on a sunday or a monday then you'd I'd put some baiting when i left and just try and get it get it established so that september uh, i think there was about 80 fish in the big lake back then i had 25 bites in three sessions and mm. things just clicked together for me the fish just got on the bait uh sorry four sessions the fish just got on the bait and it just it just all fell into place you know the first session i had, I had six bites off first point and i can't get back in first point so I went on second point. I had um, I don't know, five or six bites off um, second point. And then I did a longer session and had something like 10 bites. And then couldn't get any of them two swims again. So I ended up on no point with a couple more fish. I fished three different swims over four different sessions and had um, 25 bites when I think the rest of the lake did two or three bites. And then mm-hmm. the knives come out then, don't they? You know, he shouldn't be on here. He gets free bait. He shouldn't be on here doing this. It's mm. not fair. He's been doing this. He's been doing that. He's been fishing extra rods, sniding reeds. And I ain't done any of that. I just, mm. I just fish. <laughs> I just put bait in and fish to my advantage. I couldn't fish in the summer because my, you know, I had a baby. Um, and when, when, you know, when, when Zoe felt more confident to, to, that I could leave for a bit longer, you know, I, I made full advantage of that and I caught some fish and, I, I, I was apparently I was getting the, you know the knives were properly out and I didn't I didn't find out until later till you know a guy that I know uh, reasonably well sort of put a lot of people right saying you know hang on a minute he's always got free bait he he, he he got to catch some fish beforehand to get free bait sort of, of course. thing that's uh, the bit people don't get and, yeah yeah that's it and um, yeah I got a bit of backbiting on that and and some grief and it nearly cost me getting on to Grendon uh, mm. which was five miles up the road because the, the owner of Grendon had heard some grief about me. Um, 
uh, and I went down and spoke to him and, and he, he come in, he didn't admit to doing it at the time. He, was, he told me four months later, he says, all that stuff I heard about you was absolutely rubbish one time. I says, what do you hear? And he told me, I says, yeah. He says, I'm glad I took a chance on you. And he was, he's, it, it, it can't harm you. And it can't, you know, in, in certain areas, it can upset you getting on certain waters if you get a clicks against you. It's, Mark, it's, Mark it's horrible have, when they all start going. <laughs> you're preach, preaching to the choir here. <laughs> you know, Mark and I have experienced it a lot. And back in the days, I was a bit more brash and confident and I was, uh, fuck them you know what i mean say what they want but it does hurt you you know later on down the line because you know throw enough shit and and it sticks and don't get me wrong you know there's no true carpenter hasn't put a snide rod out every now and again you know or or yeah. waded a rod into the out of bounds or you know whatever you know true yeah. carp hunters you, if you're going to set yourself up up above the rest um you know you probably uh you're probably extremely motivated, you know. That. Yeah, but if, if somebody calls you out for putting a snide out, you sort of think, well, fair dues, you've got me there. But when, when people are making stuff up that you haven't done wrong, well, it, that, it does that's make you what up. happens, yeah. That, that, that's yeah, I mean, I, I, I can remember on, 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 on one occasion, the bailiff comes around, uh, and this, this, this I, won't, I won't name the lady, but the, the bailiff was quite a character. He, he could be quite firm at times, but he also had a, a sort of jovial side. And, you know, if, if he caught you breaking the rules, he'd come down in a ton of bricks, but he liked to have a laugh at you at the same time. Hmm. And he sort of come round and he's right and looked in the swim next door, looked in his little cut so he looked all around, looked up. I says, what, what, what are you looking for, Charlie? He says, I'm looking for your snide rod. He says, You won't catch me fishing a snide rod, Charlie. He says, I know your type, you fish snide rods. I says, I've just watched you walk around the lake, mate. You think I'm not gonna wind it in? And he, he laughed at me, thought I was joking, I'm like yeah. <laughs> me and Dave call it the Roy. Like, where's the Roy? It's the Roy Schneider. Um, <laughs> It's uh, it's it's always it's a bit of a running joke, and you walk into your mate's swim. It's like, where is it then? You know. Like, <laughs> I, I, I think. Uh, I mean, to be honest, um, like I, I, I've for, for all joking about you know breaking the rules and, and doing whatever. I've got utmost respect. I don't. I'm I'm a when in Rome person. You know, if it's yeah. the done thing to put a snide out at night, I'll have a snide out if everyone else is doing yeah. it. If it's not the done thing, I w I wouldn't gain an advantage that somebody else has got i'll just do if everybody fishes that swim that's technically out of bounds or they wade into that area if everyone does it i'm doing it i'm not gonna put myself at a disadvantage um but i wouldn't break you know i'd never fish a day days only lake at night when everyone else is at the gate at four in the morning queuing to get in and i'm sneaking around the back laughing my bollocks it wouldn't happen you know it's no. again no, it's no, integrity no, again you know yeah and it's, it's it's the same with with the situation i've just mentioned and uh, the, you know the bailiff actually told me he says look if no one's on the lake, you know, I don't mind somebody sticking a fourth out. It's it's fine. If the lake's busy, don't do it. And that's and that's perfectly fine. Fair you know, enough, that's, yeah. that, that's 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 the way you look at things, you know. You, you wouldn't you wouldn't stick a, a fourth rod out on a Saturday night when the lake's round. You just don't do that sort of thing. <laughs> but if you're the only one on there and, and you know, the bailiff's like, Well, you know, do what you want, sort of thing, sort of you know, then then that's fine, you know, it mm -hmm. is what it is. But I just don't like I wouldn't want to be blamed for something that um, that you're not doing, you know, and that's that, that's when the knives come out, and that's when these little clicks can be quite harmful. <laughs> I've I've said it before, but um, I I'd fished for twenty odd years before I caught a forty pounder. I'd never fell out of anyone on any lake anywhere. You know, the first time I caught a forty pounder, the knives are out. Like, and it, it it's just resentment and jealousy. Like, it, and it, it's it's sadly common. But anyway, let's let's get positive. So, um, after Colin, uh, I mean, we've been on this call a long time. Uh, oh, sorry, fine. talking too much, <laughs> mate. I could talk to you all night. Like, it's uh, it's it's really interesting. But yeah, give, give us um, bring us up to date. So after Colin Shallow Lagoon, what what happened there? Um, I went on to well, it was the following year, and I was I wanted to go on Wagesbury too, and. I, I turned up down for paying into Wagebury 2. I thought I'd have a quick look at the lake. It was it was the start of April. It was about five degrees. It'd been a lot of rain. There was a northerly wind. It was Baltic. I went on a look at the lake, looked down, and it was chocolate brown. And I looked out at 140 acres and thought, I ain't got a clue what to do here. I honestly I ain't got a clue. Um, you know, I didn't have a lot of information on the lake because it was it was it only been fished for a year and everybody was hush hush. So I went to buy my ticket and I thought, sorry, I'm going to have another devil at the Ardenna Lake. I, I know where they're going to be. And I, and I know I wouldn't fish there very often, but I thought, I know where they're going to be now. I know where they wake up. There's potentially two more fifties in there. There mm. was at the time because uh, the big one from Kingsmead was on its holidays. For some reason it found its way into Kingsmead Island. And that's a, that's a fish that's still <laughs> 54. And I'm thinking that's sitting there. 
And then there's another one that hadn't been out for two years that, that later did come out at 50. Mm. So I thought potentially there's two more 50s in the lake that I haven't caught. And I thought, I know where they're going to be. I've got a rough idea. I know the lake like the back of my hand. I'll do two or three sessions on there, by which time it will be mid-April and I'll the fish in, hopefully the weather would have changed and the fish in uh, Wagebury 2 would be moving a bit more and I'd be able to find them. So I did I did the first session on on, um, we, uh, on Kingsmead Island Lake and they were having a bit of a, a social and the barbecue on on, uh, on one of the islands. So I thought it'd be rude not to join in. Um, so I, I, I boated my rigs out and it's as simple as anything. I, I, caught, I caught the fish in pretty much a similar way to how I caught it the first time. The first time I, I found a load of fish showing in one area. They were, they were just showing at about 90 yards out towards these uh, two poplar trees on the far bank. And I waited till after bite time, waited till the afternoon, and I went out in the boat and I took a big kind of arc around the sort of area, got my rod, lined the rod up with the swim and we're out with the two poplars and then come coasting through the swim. By, the, by which time, the, the clarity of the water had gone a little bit. So you had about five, six foot visibility where it was about eight, nine foot deep. So you couldn't see the bottom, you couldn't see a great deal. So I had an echo sound on. So just drifted through with the echo sound that saw where a load of weed dropped off and it was just kind of silty and low-lying weed. Um, caught the engine and just sort of drifted over the area. I thought, yeah, I'm about 90 yards out where the fish would show. Flicked the chod over the side, a few handfuls of bait, and then just sort of drifted into the bank, engaged the engine again and and, and got the rod set up. And, and that, that, that's how I fished it, and that's how I caught Roy. It's the simplest way of doing it. Mm. Uh, and then in April, when I was back on there again, I thought, they're not going to be having bait, but I know they work, wake up in a certain area um, in front of VIP swim. But there was a social going on on the island. So I thought, well, if I drop in the den, I could just tow it across in front of the VRP and hope nobody drops in that sort of area. So I towed it across probably 120, 130 yards um, and then stopped about 40 yards short of where I was fishing, just under arms, um, a chod into, into the area and literally a handful of bait and then come back. And I did that with all three rods, all in the line from sort of 30 yards off the bank to about 70 yards off the bank and, and did that. And, and then um, I had a bite. So the first bite out of the lake uh, for that year um, after after a few beers the night before, and um, yeah, funny enough, it roids again. <laughs> so I recaptured roids at uh, fifty three twelve. Oh wow! Um, so it it, it, it gone one all the way. Better than to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I felt I felt I felt a bit guilty, and I sort of gave the lads a shout because it was dawn when I caught it, and I was like. I think I know what I've got, but I'm hoping I've caught one of the others because mm. I've not looked at it properly. But it, yeah, so yeah, it arrived at, at, at 5312 and it had gone uncaught from the previous year when I caught it. And it actually went uncaught then um, for, for another 18 months. The next time it came out, it came out at 60. So <laughs> I, 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 can't, uh, I can't picture it in detail at the minute, but um, has it got one of those like overslung mouths at all? It's it's yeah, it's got a quite a big chops on it. It's not massively overslung, but it is reasonably to a degree, yeah. Um, I, only, I only ask because fish that tend to not get big fish that tend to not get caught much always seem to have that overslung mouth and mm. generally a chod or a Terry Hearn stiff rig, uh, you know, the hinge stiff, it kind of is I find that's the best rig for those type of fish that don't get caught very often. And I'm just wondering if, if you had it you know, if it didn't get caught between your capture and the capture before, um, you know, for for a period of time, then didn't get caught for a while afterwards. It could just be the way it feeds, you know, with that type of mouth. Mm. And um, I, I've found that 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 common in wool pack was the same, wasn't it? Um, only ever came out in a chod or whatever. I've I've come across a few fish. Paddle years. was it? Not fish. Yeah, paddle. Oh, yeah. yeah, and it's yeah. Only, it, it's always the ones with the overslung mouth. Um, mm. So you know, in fact, I find that a lot. Like, uh, have you ever noticed on lakes that you've fished? Uh, like, it might be a fish that doesn't come out much but one guy's had it three times you know mm -hmm. and and maybe you keep catching the same fish and there's fish yeah. that you want and i always find it's it's just how that fish feeds versus how your style of fishing you know the yeah. length of your rig or you know if you always fish short rigs there's some fish in the lake you're never going to catch because they suck from a long distance away you know if there's some mm -hmm. fish on lakes i've watched them do it they're sucking from 12 14 inches away and they never go close to a bait so if you always use a six inch hook link you're probably never catching that carp yeah. Um, yeah another guy that always uses long hook links probably doesn't catch some of the fish that you catch and but he's had that one three times or, or whatever you know have, have you come across that yeah 100 percent. There's, there's a lake one now and i, I started fishing it in oh, i'm trying to think what year 2014 i started fishing it um and i i, I did quite well that first year and, the, and 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 second and third year to be honest um and i caught quite a lot of the fish out there 
you know, and I've rejoined. I rejoined last year, um, just because I was I was let down on a couple of other tickets, uh, and the fish had got a lot bigger. Tyson, uh, which is now a, a kind of all day long fifty pounder now, it's doing some big weights, and I'd had pretty much most of the fish in the lake, and some of them four times over, uh, and, and I think I think, I think about three out of four of the fish four times over, but I couldn't catch that big one, um, and, and maybe there's something in it saying in rigs, but you just you just can't target that fish in in any way because there's no rhyme or reason to where it gets caught from. Mm. It's 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 pretty much like the lady, um, although, although the lady was predictable to a certain degree, wasn't it? But um, certain times of year, but yeah, well, it was fairly random. Didn't like getting caught off the same spots a lot, yeah. you know. It's, so sometimes it's very, that's all the info you've got about a fish. It's like, where's it been caught from? Right, I'm not going to fish that gravel patch yeah. or that little spot. Or... Yeah, it's like Choco Choc was the same. In all my time, when I was fishing for Choco, I four seasons on there so I did three and three and a half years it only came out the same swim once and that's when I caught it and it never ever came off the same spot never came off the same spot twice it was just so hard to target from that there was there was no real rhyme or reason about how to catch it and this this Tyson that's that's the same it's been out of pretty much every swim on the lake now um and every area on the lake and there's there's just no way of targeting it you know you, you, you just it just doesn't seem to come out. I, I thought I'd find a time of year when it comes out, and it did come out four or five years on the bounce in the same week, and it's not done it for the last three years. So that's <laughs> that's that one now at the window. So yeah, I'm I'm as I'm as blind as everybody else. But there's there's a few guys on there that. Oh, oh I think my phone has died. Oh, is it the battery? Yeah, I can still hear you though. Yeah, we can still hear you, Ed. Oh yeah, you can't plug the battery in. Well, um. How about we wrap it up now? Because uh, we've just been not far off two hours, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, that seems like about... Well, we know it's a long one. I've got the time in front of me, but it does not seem like two hours at all. That just flowed and flew with some brilliant big fish stories from Ed there. It did. So um, I would like to, to say a big thank you to Ed, even though he's not here. But retrospectively, he will watch this uh, next week. Um, we'll sign off, Mark. Yeah, I shall... Uh, Probably see you in a day or two to record our bit, and uh, I hope your hangover's cleared up by then. You will. Um, I'm sure you're going to contact Ed and, uh, when his phone's back on, but yeah, um, uh, say thank you to him. I really enjoyed talking to him, uh, considering I had a hangover and it's the last thing I wanted to do today. I really enjoyed it. So um, I wish I yeah. could talk more, and, and maybe we will. Has he got quite a few lakes to go through that we haven't got to yet? Or are we near uh, up to date? I think we're pretty up to date. I know we did really, really well on Monk's Pit, you know, just proper boily fishing it and uh, give it a good caning. And, uh, yeah. Well, um, Bundy's as well. Oh, yeah. We well, really well, well on let, let's have a, let's, let's do another catch up with him uh, at some point. Maybe we'll do a short one when we're stuck for a guest one time or whatever. But um, <laughs> we'll uh, catch up. I really enjoyed talking to him. So, yeah, let him know. Tell him thank you. I'm going to go and get a takeaway because I'm starving. Yeah, me too. I think pizza's on the menu for tonight. Can I just, before we go, I've just got yeah. to mention one thing. What? When you sat at the right angle, that red guitar behind your head makes it look like you've got devil horns. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, and on that bombshell, it's a good night for me. the website at www.thecatcast.com there you'll find extra content merchandise and lots more to support the show including our entire back catalogue of free offerings 